Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to this event. Are you hoping for more? of the Faculty of Administration Conference 2002. Let's put our hands together for ourselves. In a while from now, we'll get on the way, the program will get on the way. And just before that, I would like to call on uh, Professor Alu Salau for the opening prayers. Professor Salau, sir. So I will rise up to pray. Let us close our eyes. Our Holy Father, we bless your name for this morning. We thank you for the preparation for this conference. We thank you, Lord, for the journey mercy for the conference participants, and especially all the principal officers present here and the guest speakers. We appreciate your goodness in our lives. We ask you, Lord, that we take all glory in Jesus' name. Father, we commit this conference into your hand, especially the opening ceremony, that the Spirit of the Lord will guide us, and all our deliberation in this conference will be fruitful, not to us alone, but to the humanity. We thank you, Lord, because you have done it. Your presence will be here. Your glory will be here. Those who are still coming on the way, Father, we pray, we grant them journey mercies in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because you have done it. For in Jesus' mighty name, we pray. A round of applause for him, please. The Vice Chancellor, Professor Adibayo Simeon Bamire, he'll be represented here today by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academy. Professor Lubola Babalola, and the Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, Professor Yomi Daramola. Please, if, if, if those applause are for them, please let's make it louder and bigger and better. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be taking the national anthem and the great for anthem now. Uh, before we continue with the rest of the program. May I ask that we rise as we take the national anthem. Let's pray. 
And the dean of the faculty of administration, Professor Kunsho Adishola. Thank you. I'll be calling on the keynote uh, speaker for today, Professor, he's my teacher, Professor William Aladi Fawali, to please come to this side of the table. I'll be calling on the lead paper uh, uh, presenter for today, Professor Anthony uh, Akinlo. The Vice Chancellor of the Regimus University, who is ably represented here today, by Dr. Bernard Fianca, to please come to the table here. I would like to introduce, I would like to recognize the presence of uh, the Chairman Committee of Deans of the University, Professor Dayo Shawande. Please stand up for recognition. I'd like to re recognize the presence of the Registrar of our University, Mrs. Margaret Omoshule, who is represented here today by the Director of Council, Mrs. Runke Ajibola. A round of applause for her. I can see some deans of faculties here. Uh, Professor Koya, of, uh, the, dean of, uh, the Dean of Technology, is here. Stand for recognition, sir. I can see the Dean of Dentistry too. Uh, please stand for recognition, Ma. I can see the Dean of Science as well. I preside you while please stand for recognition. I can see the Dean of Social Science too. Professor Lomola, please stand up for recognition. All other deans in the hall, you are welcome and you are recognized. The departmental heads, you are welcome and you are recognized. All senior professors, senior non-teaching um, staff, and senior uh, registry staff that are here present, you are all welcome to this uh, program. I would like to similarly um, recognize the presence of our uh, Howardies, our honorees for today. Uh, you are very much welcome, sir. Uh, please thank for recognition. Thank you so very much. Welcome to Obafemi Awolo University, and particularly welcome to the Faculty of Administration Conference 2022. We're pleased to have you. Right now, without wasting much of our time, I would like to call on the Dean of the Faculty to present his welcome address, Professor Adishola. A round of applause for him, please.
Professor S. A. Bamirene, the Vice Chancellor of Bafeme Holo University, Ileife. Ably represented here today by Professor M. O. Babalola, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic. Professor O. M. A. Garamola, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Administration. Principal officers of the university here present, the registrar, the bossa, provost of colleges, the chairman committee of deans, and all deans here represented. Here present, directors of units and departments, heads of departments, Dr. O. O. At DME, my vice dean, Professor W. Aladi Fowley, the keynote speaker, Professor E. A. Akilo, ably represented here today by Dr. Fianca, and as the vice chancellor of Dimas University and our lead paper presenter. Professors here present both in the Faculty of Administration and elsewhere on campus. Ambassadors, High Commissioners, Kings and Chiefs, Your Eminence, Distinguished Honorees, Dr. H. O. Adiremi, ably represented by Dr. Abiro, the Chairperson and the Deputy Chairperson of the Local Organizing Committee, and their exceptional team. Chairman of the parallel sessions, distinguished members and friends of the Faculty of Administration, distinguished pa participants and colleagues, Mr. Larry Ilufowuju, the anchor of this program, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to this auspicious occasion of the fifth Faculty of Administration International Conference. Its theme is resilience and reinvention in governance and accountability for sustainable development. It commences today, Tuesday, 29th day of uh, November, 2022, and hence tomorrow by the grace of God, 30th day of November, 2022. Indeed, this is my first opportunity to act in this capacity. I used to be in the audience and thank God I'm here today by the grace of God. And so we want to thank God. I welcome you once more and very warmly. The conference is certainly almost 10 months behind the earlier schedule of February, 2022 for reason of needless long drawn industrial action, which is a sad commentary on our nation's educational sector and its mismanagement by its handlers. Resilience and reinvention in governance and accountability for sustainable development is not only topical, but also timely and engaging in a number of ways. And I chose to pick it from here. Nigeria, May Africa, many of its states, many of the states in the world today are in the throes of organizing appropriately at different levels. There were challenges thrown to the globe by inordinate ambitions, selfishness, avarice, impunity, resource, resources, corruption, diseases, violence, crime, insurgency, insolvency, fanaticism, bigotry, climate and environmental changes, disasters, drugs, energy, leadership, followership, naivety, poverty, management, even technology to mention, but just a few. Hands are not to be thrown to the hair in despair or defeat in the face of these daunting challenges. Newer ones will certainly continue to germinate and blossom, for life itself is not static. 
we need to bear in mind, and in line with what, with what one of J.F. Kennedy's thoughts, that a man's problem was created by man, and it can be solved by man. The imperative and most courageous, whom appropriate thing to do is to be prepared, like the Boy Scouts motto. This is in tandem with Louis Pasteur's stance of chance fevers, the prepared mind. Oop. Am I going back? In doing this, we shall in this conference be assessing, be reviewing, be planning, be restoring, be retooling, be advocating, monitoring with an indefatigable zeal to take our nation out of the woods, maintain what is good for our people and future, as well as key into global best practices. Haddock in the voice of wisdom, affirms that the power to think consecutively and deeply and clearly is an avowed and deadly enemy to mistakes and blunders, superstitions, or scientific theories, irrational beliefs, unbridled enthusiasm and fanaticism. Therefore, I charge all, all and sundry, here assembled, and those sending their thoughts, because we have um, participants that are sending in their voice notes to the conference, to brainstorm in order to profile workable solutions and generate ideas needed to confront and or arrest the spirit of decay, amplify and sustain extant glorious past, or attainment of our nation, and project further for the good of today and tomorrow. It is on this note that I am delighted to welcome you to this important event. And I wish, to, I wish you fruitful and cutting edge deliberations and outcome. I'm delighted also to parade here. Some of them are still on their way to parade here today, some of our finest alumni who have not only carved niches in politics and industry and society, but have also outreached us singly and or collectively, and indeed at different times. One of them is uh, Chief Bayo Adelabu. Another is Chief Sakio Sadideji. Another is Otumba Tululokwe Ogudikwe. And one of the first honorees that, that came before almost everybody here is Chief Sunday Adeguke, the Auditor General of Ondo State. Adedeji Aditayo Esquire, Chief Abiola Falaya Job ably represented here by one of our colleagues. Honorable Olayera Ilubaju, the outgone chairman of IFE, Central Local Government. These ones are illustrious. They are illustrious benefactors. They are mobilizers. They are bridge builders. They are agents and or volunteers. But sometimes they just chose to come to our faculty and help us out and choose and help out the university without we soliciting for it. They have indeed shown commitment to scholarship and institutional growth. They have either facilitated iconic capital projects, and I will show them as we move on. Capital projects on our campus, and they have painted our faculties, maybe building inside out. I mean, inside our offices and externally. Some of them will be joining us as we move on. They have mobilized to upgrade the faculty's lightning facility, classroom facility, our library facility, and or fenced Angola Hall, Hall of Residence on our campus.
It is for these reasons that we thought that they are worthy of our commendation. Hence, the venture of bestowing on them awards of excellence uh, that will take place in some moments to come. Ad identifying and getting them, you know, because it is not very easy for deans to uh, get people across faculties, departments in the faculties. Uh, the deans here assembled to bear me witness. Uh, so, I am from the Department of International Relations. To get people from accounting is a, is a, is a Herculean task. To get people from public administration is difficult. To get people, I mean, that you know closely, that you can cause them to come uh, and commit their resources to the development of the university is a, is a Herculean task. And so, in this regard, a Professor T.O. Ashalu really helped. So this is part of the projects that they have done, they have, they have, they have sponsored. One of them facilitated the CBN sponsored administration, 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 administrative building that is ongoing on campus. I mentioned here that too, that our faculty building, main, main building was painted in and out. This was done by one of them. I mentioned that they have singly or collectively, so they have mobilized to upgrade the facility of the faculty, one of the classrooms. That was, this, this is how it looked before their intervention. Look at how it looked after their intervention. They have floodlitted our faculty's main building. So we now see many students who have benefited uh, extremely. This is what is obtainable in developed climes. So we now see many of our students after resumption coming to study, coming to, do, to organize group discussions underneath our faculty building. The day is not different from the night there. They are fenced around. You know, this is what I call the fencing around Angola perimeter fencing of Angola Hall of Residence. Um, And this was recently commissioned by the vice chancellor on the 14th day of November, 2022. This is part of um, the commissioning. So it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a product of our department or our faculty that facilitated this alumni group to contribute their resources into uh, fencing around uh, Angola Hall of Residence. He lived there while he was in school. So he just said that that is part of his commitment to scholarship and the growth of this particular place. In, in closing this remark or remarks, I want to be grateful to Professor Simeon Bamire, the Vice Chancellor and his management team. I'm so excited, I'm so, I'm so excited having you around. Thank you so very much. Uh, Professor W. Aladifa Oli is the only masquerade that we have in our department, uh, Department of International Relations. So, uh, and it's today he has agreed to be our keynote speaker. Uh, we really appreciate you. Professor Saidu Oseni and Professor Dio Ogunbile, they are our resource persons and they have decided to take on our workshop session that is going to take place in a moment from now. Professor G. A. Adiromu, to rent this particular hall is not uh, a main task in an era where eight month salaries is still outstanding. So we appreciate the rebate that we got from the management of the Center of Excellence uh, facilitated by Professor G. A. Adiromu. Our four powerful heads of department, uh, Professor Gio Akiola, Dr. T. A. Olaya, Dr. Iwebno Okwechimen, Dr. H. A. Adifeso, of the Department of Management, Accounting, Public Administration, International Relations, and Local Government Studies. 
and it really helped us to mobilize you know this place is full to the brim i've never seen it like this we thank you for coming dr h o aderemi ably represented by dr b a abioro and the local organizing committee they've been very excellent they're very excellent we want to appreciate you and the last but not the least our esteemed faculty members i'm surprised to see many of them here some of them have taken on the assignment of uh, being the chairman or the chairpersons of uh, parallel sessions distinguished participants from far and near I was Ankor University. I could see one of the participants from Ankor University, uh, Lagos. Dr. Epe, you are welcome. Gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening. Please let's do another round of applause for the team of the faculty. With the kind permission of the Vice Chancellor, I would like to recognize um, again uh, Professor Seidu Seni. I missed you out in my earlier introduction. I'd like to recognize as well the University Librarian, Dr. Femi Okutoashi. Please stand for recognition. And I would like to recognize the second um, uh, paper, workshop paper presenter here today, for Sir David Ogunbe. Please stand for recognition. You're welcome. And just before I ask the representative of the Vice Chancellor to present the Vice Chancellor's address, I will again uh, want us to recognize our honorees uh, for today. I am aware uh, Chief Adebayo Adilabu is being honored here today. Uh, Dr. Adide Gizakios, represented by Dr. Mrs. Salau, is being represented here, uh, is being awarded here today. Dr. Uh, Mr. Chris Adi, uh, Chris Adideji Adetayo, uh, will equally be honored here today. Uh, Mr. Biola Falayajo, is uh, being represented by Dr. Falade. He's going to be honored here today as well. Uh, Mr. Olayera Jacob Ilubaju will be uh, honored here today. Uh, Mr. Ogundipe Tolulope, who is being represented by Dr. Bilu, will be honored here today. And uh, I think that's all uh, for now. Uh, please, let's put our hands together for all of these awardees. Uh, the the awards are well deserved. They are well deserved. I want us to, start to know um, that. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, I've been asked to invite the the representative of the university um, registrar in person of uh, Mrs. Ronke Ajibola, right? to take uh, this seat. Please, a round of applause uh, for her. Yes. My Olga will not want this kind of attention. <laughs> All right. Um, it's time we'll listen to the chief host of this conference, uh, the vice chancellor of our university, who is represented here today by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Professor Olubola Babalola. Let's put our hands together for her. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Simeon Alibai Obamire, I want to welcome everybody to OAU. He sent in his apology because he's out of time for other pressing official assignments. He has asked me to stand in for him. The DVC administration, Professor Daramola, that's my Chris brother. You are welcome, sir. The registrar of the university, Mrs. Edowu Omosile, ably represented by Barrister Ronke Ajibola. 
Yeah, welcome. Somebody was saying, our own is not Barry Wondao. <laughs> Real Barry staff. The university librarian, Dr. Ogutu Ashe, yeah, welcome, sir. The Dean of Deans, Chairman Committee of Deans, who is also the Dean of Clinicals, Professor Shewande, you are welcome, sir. And I want to believe that Dean of Administration is key to Committee of Deans because we have an array of Deans here. Dean of Tech, Professor Koya, you are welcome, sir. I saw Dean of Dentistry there, Professor Ukong. She just stepped out. We have Dean of uh, Science here, yeah? you are welcome, sir. Dean of um, Social Sciences, Professor Lomola, you are welcome, sir. Dean of Science is Professor Adewale. So I think those are the things that are around. I'm sure others will join us very, very soon. Thanks for the support you are giving to Faculty of Administration. We have some professors around too, Professor Hussaini, you are welcome, sir. That's a uh, Immediate Parks Director of Central Office of Research. There we have, sorry, University Research Office. We have Professor Ogunbile, you are welcome, sir. Former Acting Provost of PG. So you are really invited key people here, important dignitaries. So we appreciate everybody, all the professors in the Faculty of Administration. Thanks for putting this together. We appreciate all of you for the good work we are all doing. All the directors that are here, professors from other faculties, you're all welcome. Okay. All the awardees too, you're welcome, sir. And you have set a pace for us. You were the first to be here. And I'm sure you are coming from Odo. We appreciate you, sir. Madam, you're welcome, sir. Thanks for the support. We welcome you, sir. You are representing one of the awardees. Everybody is welcome. All the staff, of a faculty of admin and the university at large, both teaching and non-teaching, you are all welcome. Great if you're students. We are happy that you are here because you know you are our future. We are building you. And I'm sure that your coming here, your presence there means a lot to us. And you're going to gain so many things. We appreciate those that are join, joining us online. Thanks for your presence too. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the vice chancellor, I say you're all welcome. I wish to welcome into our miss, Professor A.E. Akinlo, who is ably represented by Dr. Fianca. You're welcome, sir. And I want to say also that Professor Akinlo has two representatives there. She's already smiling. We have the wife here with, here with us too. That's Professor Mrs. Akinlo. You're welcome, man. She's the director of Tech Fund. So if you want money, please get closer to her. Please stand up for recognition. <laughs> Let people see you. By the power of the mic, by the power conferred on me by the vice chancellor, stand up for recognition. <laughs> You're welcome, man. <laughs> Okay, so Professor Akilo is the Vice Chancellor of Redeemers University in Ocean State. We also welcome our lead paper presenter. That's uh, Professor Ogunbile and Professor Useni. You're all welcome, sirs. All the other principal officers that are here. No, this one, this, I'm speaking like VC now. So the ones I said before were for me. So what I'm saying now is from the VC. So all the principal officers, we appreciate you for honoring our invitation. In the same vein, I welcome the provost of colleges, deans of other faculties present, our keynote speaker, Professor Halade Fawole of the Department of International Relations. You are welcome, sir. There is something about Professor Fawole and it's not known to him. I know you are from Ikiri. <laughs> So because I have a student that's like your cousin, not known to you, he just sold me. So anytime I see you, I see that's my students all over you. <laughs> so you're yeah, welcome, sir. Thanks for accepting to deliver the keynote address. And I know that are coming here, we are going to gain a lot from your presentation. 
all the eminent professors, all the royal highnesses that are here. I can't see any king go. Maybe they're on their way. Okay, all the royal highnesses, all our great alumni that are here, all the whole, uh, our deeds of today, members of diplomatic community and honorable members of the House of Assembly. The presence of the workshop paper presenters, Professor Saidu Hosseini, former director of the University Research Office of Afemi Aula University, and Professor Dio Ogunbile, the former acting provost of the PG College, are highly recognized and appreciated. I'm delighted to appreciate and welcome you all to the fifth Faculty of Administration's International Conference holding today. I congratulate the Dean of the Faculty, Professor E.F. Adeshola, all the local organizing team, and indeed the entire members of the Faculty of Administration for deeming it fit to reschedule this conference in view of the long industrial action by the staff unions and its attendance on towards effects on staff and students of the university. As some of us will recall that the university, the conference was scheduled initially to hold earlier in the year, but that was not made possible due to the long strike. We thank God for the restoration of academic activities to our campuses. I'm sure the students are very, very happy for the strike that has ended. May I crave your indulgence also to appreciate and welcome all our numerous resource persons and participants from Fahane, all staff and students of the Faculty of Administration, distinguished members of Obafe Miawolo University community, ladies and gentlemen. The theme of this year's conference is resilience and reinvention in governance for accountability and sustainability. On this, I want to give kudos to the organizers and those that cover this theme, because I could see in the theme of the conference that it captured all the four departments in a faculty of administration. When you talk about resilience, you know, that all goes to the Department of Local Government and uh, development studies. So that department, I know they are resilient. So you should clap for yourself. Yes. And when you talk about reinvention, is about international relations. That is, we need to internalize ourselves. So reinvention is for international relations. And governance, of course, governance is for what? Public administration departments. And lastly, the last but not the least is accountabilities for which departments. So that all the four departments are captured just in one thing. We should clap for the organizers. And the four of them put together is for sustainable development. That is the key thing now. We have SDG, Sustainable Deve Development Goals. And these four are embedded in the SDGs. The title has been specially chosen in consideration of the present economic realities and governance in our country. I'm therefore delighted to identify with the faculty in his efforts to expand the frontiers of knowledge in local politics, management, monetary, as well as public and international affairs via his up-to-date academic and social activities. It is gratifying to know that 52 presentations are expected to be made at this conference in the fields of accounting, finance and economics, business administration, politics, governance and development, local policies, public administration and development. All these will be done in two days. The mode of presentation will be by mode, in which presentations will be physical and uh, virtual. That is, it's going to be hybrid. I'm persuaded that the conference engenders critical discourses on the state of our nation. Nigeria and the continent, Africa. How many of us are happy about the situation in Nigeria? Nobody is happy. So that means this conference is key, it's topical, and we should all pay attention to all the things that will, that will be discussed. And I want to enjoy the organizers, so the dean of the faculty members, please, whatever you do, don't let it just end there. Let's publicize it. The a uh, communicate that will come out of it, the half come, please. Let's make it known to those, to all the stakeholders, so that we will not just be doing this in vain. 
This opening ceremony also will feature awards of excellence to reputable and deserving alumni drawn from all walks of life. I therefore congratulate and welcome the prospective awardees and encourage them to remain steadfast and be more committed to services deserving of honor. You have been honored today because of what we have done. And you know, we can never have enough. And like Oliver Tees, we also ask for more. More than what you have done for us in the past, we want you to do for us. I like to invite all the participants, especially first timers, visiting a great university for the first time. We want you to relax. We want you to move around our campus because you know our campus is the most beautiful campus in Africa. And we are not just making mouths. So if you are coming here for the first time, I want you to move around and see the beauty, the aesthetics of this campus, which is unique in all ramifications. God has endowed us with nature and great minds that have put all these things together. And I'm sure that you will not regret doing so. Rather, you apply to come over and over again. You apply to come and to stay with us. Once again, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all and wish you fruitful deliberations as I declare the conference open. Thank you and God bless. I'm going to request that we all stand and give another round of applause to the Vice Chancellor. I respectfully ask for this. Please, let's do another round of applause to the Vice Chancellor. Thank you. You may have your seats. Now we are getting to the real business, the real reasons why we are here. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite to the podium to deliver the key note address for this conference. A teacher of teachers, a role model, a distinguished scholar, a diplomat par excellence, a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me, Professor Willie Aladi Paoli. As he steps forward to deliver the keynote address. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, one of the advantages of not being the first person to speak is that the protocols are already published. So with your kind permission, I want to stand on all existing protocols. But be that as it may, permit me the special privilege of acknowledging a few people. First, I do not have any other job. I'm still a lecturer at Obafemi Aolo University, so I must acknowledge the presence of my vice chancellor, Professor Simon Bamire, who is ably represented by the deputy vice academic, Professor Babalola, and of course, the deputy vice chancellor administration, my friend, my brother, my colleague, my soulmate of many years, Professor Daramola. I'm a member of the Faculty of Administration, so I must, since I, I cannot be transferred to any other faculty, I must give honor to whom it is due, recognize my dean, Professor Funsho Adeshola. And one of the reasons I also have to acknowledge him is that without his approval, uh, the committee will not have invited me to be a keynote speaker. Uh, 
Oh, let me thank uh, the Vice Chancellor, Redeemers University, ably represented by my brother, Dr. Ben. You're welcome. And last but not the least, I'm a member of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, Obafemi Olo University branch, and nationally. And therefore, I want to appreciate the presence in our midst of the branch chairman of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, Professor Tony Oduwe. You're welcome, Chair. Um, a keynote address, from my understanding, at a conference is like a curtain razor. It is the speech that sort of sets the ball rolling. And yesterday I got uh, information from the local organizing committee restricting me to 20 minutes. So I went through the paper and started junking so many things out of it because I actually wrote a full paper, which I hope if they are publishing, it will be published. I try to see if I can narrow my presentation down to 20 minutes. But looking at the program this morning, I see that I've been restricted to 10 minutes. I cannot speak for 10 minutes. And therefore, with the indulgence of the Dean of the Faculty of Administration, I would try to spend about 20 minutes because I've tried even to limit everything. So, and the reason I'm saying this is, the importance of a keynote speech at a conference must not be undervalued, okay? But having said that, the topic of my presentation is exactly the theme of the conference. But inside it, I'm going to pick up a few issues. And so, leaving so many portions of it aside, I want to start by talking, uh, by, 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 I want to start the presentation by talking on the political aspects. And I call this portion, reversing autocratization, reinventing democratic governance and accountability for, sus for, for sustainable development. Democratization is a process towards eventual consolidation of democratic system, a continuous journey towards making democracy the only game in town and not to be conceived as a definitive bus stop. Since Nigeria's democratic system has backslidden so spectacularly on account of deliberate autocratization by its operators, the nation state must have to return to that fork in the road, to that particular point where we had made a wrong turn. This is a necessary process of reinvention and redemocratization. As the saying goes, it does not matter how far you have gone down the wrong road, you can never arrive at the expected correct destination. So what must a nation do like ours? Retrace ourselves to that point where we made a wrong turn. Pulling Nigeria back from the precipice of disaster and ultimate collapse is a task that requires the kind of political sagacity, strategic foresight and willingness, which unfortunately the present government sorely lacks. A reality check. We must have to look beyond the present administration, the present government, for us to begin any serious reinvention and self rejuvenation, because this government is already a part of the clog in the wheel of progress. I must, however, warn that the process of reinvention and rebirth cannot be accomplished in one fell swoop, as the damage and distortions that have already been done to the fabric of the Nigerian state and its democratic system are enormous and will thus require time, patience, sagacity, tact, and diplomacy, backed by enormous goodwill on the part of all concerned to avert the looming catastrophic implosion. Democratic backsliding, I hasten to say, is not peculiar to Nigeria. It is a global phenomenon which develops usually gradually rather than by leaps. It is not limited to any country, any region, any race, neither is it peculiar to Africa. 
all democratic societies are inherently susceptible to backsliding over time, likely because of the complexity of liberal democracy, its often ponderous methods and slow processes, as well as its sometimes chaotic characteristics. In Nigeria's case, its military-guided democracy was chaotic right from the beginning. And even two decades down the road, not much has changed. That is, the authoritarian predilections of its operators and guardians that were imbibed from decades of military dictatorship still remain quite strong and pervasive. The case is not helped because of the preferment and positioning of retired army generals in strategic and sensitive national positions. I just name a few of them, like Ministry of Defense, the Office of the Chief of Staff to the President, except the present one, Office of the National Security Advisor, Headship of Nigerian Customs Service, National Drug Law uh, Enforcement Agency, just a few, with overbearing influence on what is ordinarily a democratic government. The fate of democracy is being shaped by retired military officers who have yet to fully divest themselves of their authoritarian predilections. Two of the four democratic presidents in the Fourth Republic are retired generals, and you know the consequences. Am I accusing the retired military brass of being responsible for our nation's democratic ills? Not necessarily so, but the military's influence in all aspects of national life remain pervasive and overbearing. In recent times, the Nigerian government has employed all manner of trickery and subterfuge to subvert and weaken democratic governance, ostensibly in defense of democracy. For example, President Muhammadu Buhari brazenly asserted at the 2018 annual conference of the Nigerian Bar Associations, uh, Nigerian Bar Association conference, that the rule of law must be subjected to the supremacy of the nation's security and national interest. That was what he said. Those are his words. This tallies with what two professors from Harvard have said, and I quote them. One of the great ironies of how democracies die is that the very defense of democracy is often used as a pretext for its subversion. Would be autocrats often use economic crises natural disasters, and especially insecurity th uh, security threats, such as wars, armed insurgencies, or terrorist attacks to justify autocratic and anti-democratic tendencies. Autocratization signified the descent into unchecked personalist rule in spite of constitutional provisions of checks and balances. It also signifies utter and visceral disregard for democratic norms and ethos reckless subversion of procedures and time-honored democratic principles and practices, brazen demonstration of contempt for the principles of separation of governmental powers, exhibition of crassly autocratic tendencies by leaders who bluntly refuse to be held to the norms of democratic at accountability, and so on. These iniquitous tendencies, I must emphasize, did not begin with the present highly nepotistic and vengeful Buhari administration, although the culpability for their exacerbation lies squarely with him. President Olusha Gwaba Sanjo, another former military dictator turned Democrat, was the one that actually set the ball rolling. And I don't have time to explain because of the limited uh, time that is available to me. What Buhari has done is simply to compound authoritarianism by his personal predilection for heavy handedness, uncanny rigidity, nepotism, religious bigotry, political intolerance, ethnic exceptionalism, and sectional supremacy, and other outright anti democratic characteristics that have reopened all the subsisting uh, cracks and fissures in the Nigerian national architecture, making the country today more fractious and more fragile than ever, and invariably rendering good governance and accountability an alien philosophy. 
Now, can Nigeria be reformed or should it ever be reformed? Can and should Nigeria be reformed and be reinvented? Is our democratic backsliding redeemable? My answer, personal answer is certainly and indubitably yes. My optimism is predicated on the notion that a broken and undemocratic Nigeria is a far worse and inconceivable alternative to contemplate. Since my answer is in the affirmative already, the next poster then is how and by what means can we reinvent Nigeria? Can we reform this country? Nigeria, in my view, can still be reinvented. It can be pulled back from the gradual slide into autocracy or democratic deterioration, most especially because the current experience with our current experience with backsliding has not yet reached the extreme end with a military coup, for it is infinitely more challenging to reverse military authoritarianism than to reform is a backsliding democracy. No doubt, Nigeria's governance architecture has been so bent out of shape, the federalism so corrupted that it is merely a caricature of its former self, but it is still amenable to being reformed. I'm a firm believer, and let me say this very authoritatively, I am a firm believer that Nigeria can be redeemed and can yet be made to function better and efficiently if properly reformed than if it is not. For the alternative may be a violent catastrophic implosion. There are nations in the world that are dissolved catastrophically and the consequences decades after are still there. So we need to reform. That is why I've taken this position. But I will also assert without equivocation that notwithstanding the desirability of national reinvention for the purpose of achieving sustainable development and an accountable Nigerian nation, the journey will not be an easy one. Nigeria's political and social fabrics have almost been corrupted beyond repair, that the trust deficit in central governance will not be easily repaired. But for me, I want to caution patience, and I'm against separatism, that we must not allow contemporary popular anger against the Buhari autocracy to push us into the option of a violent self-immolation, the type that old Yugoslavia suffered and whose wounds are yet to heal decades after. Let us look beyond the present Buhari uh, toxic brand, whose expiry date is already near anyway, to begin to reimagine and reinvent the Nigeria of our dreams, the one that our founding nationalists sacrificed so much to bequeath to us. The existence of a nation, and I must stress this, the existence of a nation cannot be determined in one generation or under one regime. Nations can always come back from adversarial experiences, reform and reinvent. We see nations that historically were destroyed and, and they came back. Japan after the second war, Germany was destroyed and occupied and divided. Today, it is the largest economy uh, in Europe. So countries can come back from such experiences, okay? Pardon me, if it seems, only if it seems that I have placed much emphasis on democratic governance, but I must admit it is a deliberate issue for me. And this is because of the reality that development in any form is a function of the character of governance at any point in time. For development to be sustainable, that is durable and beneficial in the long run, it requires both an elite consensus and a collective buy-in by the mass of the people. That is, we're talking of an elite mass consensus regarding the nature, the shape, the modalities for achieving durable development. And this speaks prominently to the quality of governance. Hence, my emphasis on governance as sine qua non. Many people think you can have governance on it, it does not. You see, political decisions are the ones that result in development or underdevelopment or otherwise, not economic decisions. They are political decisions. Today, if you establish an industry that will serve Nigeria, by a stroke of pen, an executive order from the federal government can destroy it. That is politics, not economics. 
Sustainable development, according to the United Nations means, and I quote, development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs, unquote. What is being stressed here by me is, uh, uh, and according to the United Nations, is that the right and entitlement of every generation to utilize and enjoy the resources that nature has endowed humanity with in such a responsible manner and with the utmost consideration that today's developmental activities must not impair coming generations from being able to sustain decent existence. None of this is possible without deliberate effort on the part of government, which will put the requisite policies in place for achieving development sustainability. In the same vein, accountability is a function of the quality of politics and governance. It is actually a deliberate choice and not a chance occurrence. Singapore, a country that began in 1965 and in one generation was able to transport itself from a third to a first world country in one generation is a veritable example. And it is political, it's not economic. So what are some of the modalities? I don't have plenty of time left. What are some of the modalities and mechanism for democratic reinvention and rebirth for sustainable development in the final analysis. I, I just want to make a quick, a, a, a few quick ones. Number one, re-architecting the entire political system is a sine qua non, an inevitable and irreducible minimum without which reforming governance in Nigeria will remain a mirage. This is largely because governance is not always a purely technocratic endeavor, as many analysts erroneously imagine. It must be accompanied by emotional intelligence, that is, taking cognizance of and giving due consideration to people's expressed feelings and sentiments. Number two, dispassionately addressing the canker worm of corruption that has destroyed the fabric of good governance in this country. Successive governments have laid claims to fighting corruption, and I put the word fighting in, in inverted commas, to fighting corruption without much to show for it because the nation has not defined what corruption is. Thus, fighting corrupt individuals is not the same thing as fighting corruption. Fighting corruption must be holistic and targeted, not the current sporadic and cosmetic trial of some high level individuals mere for publicity you know, and leaving the central and core issues unaddressed. Number three, lean and efficient government at all levels. As it is, government in Nigeria is too huge, over bloated. Therefore, it is slow, ponderous, and grossly inefficient to deliver quality governance. Overcoming this requires creating and running a lean government with modern techniques, modern ICT tools for e-governance. All this must be embraced so that we can achieve you know, governance efficiency. Number four, allowing existing institutions to function and to thrive such that in the long run, adherence to norms, processes and procedures of accountable governance would have become, for the want of a better word, institutionalized. That is, it would have become drilled into the psyche and the sensibilities of people such that it would become a mere reflex, obeying them. You just obey reflexively. Number five, not much can be accomplished unless and until we fix Nigeria's huge, ponderous, dysfunctional, and corrupt public service bureaucracy. It is a great stumbling block to efficiency and accountability, and I won't say more than that. Number six, government's primary responsibility must be stressed. Many people think governments will give you food and things like that. That's not government. A government's primary responsibility is provision of security and protection for all in its territory to enable them to enjoy their rights and freedoms and to maximize their potentials for self-actualization and collective development. Nigeria's precarious insecurity must be accorded the seriousness and priority that it deserves. By way of concluding remarks, I have thus far focused on matters political 
not out of disciplinary bias on my part as a political scientist, nor is it because it is simply convenient for me to ignore other avenues, but it is based on the centrality of politics in the affairs of man. Politics, according to Aristotle, is the master science because it concerns, according to David Easton, the authoritative allocation of values in a society. And according to Harold Laswell, who gets what, when, and how. All these make us to understand that all areas of collective existence necessarily bow to and respond to compelling political dictates. It impacts, that is politics impacts directly and so overwhelmingly on all other areas of collective existence in a way that no other issue or phenomenon does. It determines the totality of the environment in which all other forms of individual and collective activities take place. It determines by what means and how far a country will develop. Today, Fisiparos forces are gnawing at Nigeria's soul, the soul of the Nigeria state, threatening its survivability, thus rendering any thought of economic progress and development impossible. No society can develop when it is simultaneously confronted by a host of nation-wrecking challenges, such as Nigeria is currently grappling with. Aside from Boko Haram, or the Boko Haram menace, which has metastasized into transnational insurgency from the northeast corner. There's also banditry, mass kidnapping and abductions, which have become a burgeoning new industry and complicating security all over the nation. This is why I have given primacy to political variables. Even economic development, even economic development, as desirable as it is, does not happen outside the purview and dictates of politics. If anything, it is ipso facto a function of and responds to the will of political decision makers. So the reality is that Nigeria cannot be fixed outside politics or in the absence of conscious political engineering and re-engineering. I have in this address given only a broad sweep of our problems and suggested some ways forward without me going into the details or the nitty gritty of each one. This is because I know that the scientific papers that will still be presented will address each of these issues in detail. I rest my case. And once again, I want to appreciate the unique opportunity to address the opening session of this conference. And I wish all of us informed deliberations that will take our nation forward. Thank you all. Thank you very much for that louder round of applause this time. And just before we proceed to take the lead paper of this conference. I've been asked to announce to uh, the audience that um, the organizers have provided um, for a tea break outside the hall when it's time. They expect all, us to, uh, all of us to uh, get there. And um, secondly, um, uh, Professor Faolisa, I've been asked to uh, request a soft copy of your paper for uh, the purpose for the sake of um, the students hearing and any other member of uh, the audience that would uh, want to have uh, a soft copy. You have it here already, sir. Dr. Bureau, uh, can you please have it from him? Thank you very much, sir. All right, while we are sorting that, um, have been instructed by the 
the Vice Chancellor, represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, Professor Onubola Babalola, to ask the university librarian, Dr. Femi Ogutuashi, to join um, the, the, the iTable here to take the place of the Deputy Vice Chancellor Admin, who just um, stepped out. When he comes in, I please a round of applause for him in, a, in absentia. When he comes in, he, he will join. He, all right, he, he's already in. Uh, sir, you, you take the seat next to the DVC card. Thank you very much. Now we'll be taking the lead um, paper. And before um, we'll do that, I would like to request the representative of um, the lead paper presenter, Dr. Bernard Fianca, um, to please approach uh, the podium here. Uh, stand up, sir. Um, we'll be taking the citation of the lead paper presenter. You may just stay there, sir. And um, I would like to call on, sorry, sorry. I'd like to call on Dr. Dolapo Fitz Sule. Uh, if she's in the hall, uh, please come. A round of applause for her, please. Let's keep it, let's keep, let's keep clapping till she gets here. Mm -hmm. She will be presenting the citation of um, the lead paper presenter in person of Professor Tony Akinlo, the Vice Chancellor of the Dimas University at the Russian State. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. Permit me to stand on existing protocol. It is an honor to read the citation of Professor A. E. Akinlo the Vice Chancellor of Widimas University, Ede, who is represented by Dr. Ben. Professor Anthony Eni Soakinlo is an Astu scholar and a professor of repute who was born in Odeaye, Ondo State, Nigeria. He obtained BSc in economics in 1985 from University of Ife, which is now the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ile Ife. He further obtained MSc and PhD in economics in 1985 and 1995 from the same university. By dint of hard work, he attained the professorial cadre in October 1998, and he was appointed a full professor of economics in October 2000. He enjoyed accelerated promotion throughout his career at the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife. Professor Akilo is currently the vice chancellor of the Redeemers University, Ede. He specializes in monetary and development economies, and his research interests span through economic reforms, foreign direct investment, and economic growth. He has over 160 peer reviewed publications in high, in high impact journals, such as the Journal of Policy Modeling, Applied Economics, Energy Economics, Journal of Economics, and Business, Developing Economics, and many more. He was one of the first economists to discover the differential impact of oil and non-oil foreign direct investment on economic growth in developing economies. His published articles are highly rated as they featured in reputable journals such as Science Direct. Professor Akilo has made significant contributions to research in the area of economic policy formulation and implementation in many countries in sub saharan Africa. Many of his works on economic reforms, monetary economies, 
development economies and energy economies have provided recommendations to governments at various levels in formulating monetary, fiscal, and developmental policy in several developing countries. He has successfully supervised over 30 PhD theses. and 36 MSCTCs in the Department of Economics. Professor Akilo served meritoriously in many capacities as the head of the Department of Economics, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, and Director of the Center, all at Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife. He has equally served as a visiting professor to many international research centers including, but not limited to, United Nations, World Institute for Research and Development, UN WIDA, and Institute of Developing Economies, Japan. He has served as consultant to many international organizations, including the United Nations Development Organization, World Bank, and IDRC. He is currently, he is currently the Vice Chancellor Redeemers University, Ede, and has brought his vast experience in university administration to bear. Under his leadership, Redeemers University was ranked by the NUC as the 2021 best private university and second best university in Nigeria. This is a university that has hosted the World Bank sponsored Africa Center of Excellence for Genomic of Infectious Diseases. SGID. The university also won the 2021 Nigeria Academy of Science Gold Medal Prize for Life Sciences. This center has become a continental powerhouse in the prevention, control, and elimination of infectious diseases worldwide. Professor Akilo is a proven transformative leader with a track record of team approach that motivates and influences people to be at their best. He is known to prompt people and his subordinates to succeed and win. He is happily married to Professor Mrs. Solain Kakilo Ni Aborishade, who is a professor of accounting, and they are blessed with awesome children. Professor A. E. Akilo is a devoted Christian and currently the pastor in charge of King's Pavilion, Redeemed Christian Church of God, or Shoeproof in Seven, Ile Ife. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Professor Anthony Eniso Akilo, the lead speaker of this conference. Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to be here this morning in the capacity of the Vice Chancellor of Demands University, Professor. And so, Akinlo, uh, I would like to first appreciate uh, the Vice Chancellor, uh, Obafemi Awolowo University, ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor, uh, members of the management team present, Dean Faculty of Administration, all other deans and provosts present, and uh, especially uh, my boss's uh, better half, Professor Mrs. Akinlo. Um, the shoes I'm stepping in is very big shoes, as you can see. And uh, I'm under a lot of pressure not to disappoint my boss. <laughs> However, I would like to point out that when it was mentioned that Redeemers University came first among private universities, there were some murmurings. <laughs> Regardless, I would like to point out the fact that in the past couple of years, we have received imports of the best brains from University of Ife, OAU. Several of them are here. Uh, I can see Professor Ade here also. So I, I would imagine 
I would imagine that what would you expect if a university like Obafemi Awolowo University is expecting all her brains to the demands, you know, what would you expect will happen? Of course, your child will emulate you and definitely perform very, very good. So uh, I believe that the Rinmas University is a child that was born properly and must give due respect to elders in the land. Thank you very much. Um, I would uh, also like to express my gratitude to the conference organizers for this great privilege. I bring greetings from the Redmond University, Ede. The theme of the conference is resilience and reinvention in government and accountability for sustainable development. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from setbacks and grow stronger. The question I presume this conference aims at interrogating is the connection between governance and sustainable development. Hence, the inability of our economies and societies to be resilient enough to achieve sustainable development through resource governance will be a key focus of this paper. More importantly, I would like, I would not only engage with reinvention in governance, but with thinking governance. To this end, I present this paper titled the thinking and reinventing resource governance for sustainable human development. Introduction. The need for inventing current approaches to governance in Africa is without doubt a strategic element of any sustainable development movement on the continent. However, reinvention or rethinking suggests a systemic failure and a systemic failure that is likely to reoccur if the fundamental underpinnings of the regional structure are not being, are not addressed and understood. Our interrogation of failed systems will require an approach that may not necessarily subsist within the proverbial box, but embody the concept of breaking the usual modes of perceiving and theorizing the solutions of Africa's problems. This necessarily requires that we not only think outside the box, but first attempt to understand the box itself that has put constraints on Africa's development in terms of resilience. Thus, an attempt to understand the box within which Africa's development, developmental problems exist brings one into contact with a vast amount of literature on the problems of underdevelopment in Africa, which is largely bedeviled by theoretical conceptualizations of the ideal framework for development. None, however, seems to in reality provide a reliable strategy for advancing sub-Saharan societies. Conveniently sandwiched within this literature is the age-old tussle between colonial apologists, on one hand, and advocates of dependency theory as the root of Africa's underdevelopment, on the other. In an attempt to unravel the box, some scholars have called for a paradigm shift from the colonial dependency theory which Ahmed 2013 claims is no longer tenable, but rather explore more cogent explanations like the elite theory that places the burden of Africa's underdevelopment on the shoulders of corrupt African leaders in cohorts with the key players of the metropolitan economies of the West. As convenient as this may sound, dismissing dependency on the basis of the present sociopolitical realities may pose a problem in trying to understand the box which we ought to think outside of. Dependency is inextricably linked to colonialism and the true nature and impact of colonial enterprise on Africa cannot expire because academics have argued it away. A flippant summation of the colonial effect within the simple frame of economic underdevelopment is a dire misjudgment of the historicity of colonialism in Africa. In pursuit of solutions outside the box, this paper will seek to engage with the crucial fulcrum of underdevelopment, which is resource governance. The ensuing discourse in this paper is not intended to examine the best strategies of resource governance, but rather to interrogate the historicity of resource governance in Africa and identify the box which Africans must think out of. It is this exercise that is likely to avail us of a more nuanced an elaborate perception of Africa's underdevelopment and also reinvent 
what sustainability will represent for present and future African societies. This exercise will cover theoretical expectations for resource governance and then explore the dialectic materialism of global resource governance with Africa as the source of the resource the world has always governed. As earlier mentioned in this paper, there seems to be no shortfall in developmental or government theories that seem to propose strategies for developing African economies. The challenge that however remains is effective policy implementation and subsequent continuity or sustainability to these processes. Thus, the rethinking or reinvention process has to be focused on the factors interfering with the policy implementation and sustainable continuity, which ensures resilience. Historically, foreign interference in policy implementation processes in African affairs has remained a major culprit to a certain school of thought. The role of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, World Bank during the high tide of neoliberal economics goes to prove this point, trickle down economics. In my thinking, neoliberal economics is a staple in the history of dialectics of class struggle for power and control of resources, especially in Africa. Consequently, trickle down economics and classic Keynesianism have always been frames designed to govern resources in developing worlds for the benefit of the developed world. The basic structure of these theories attest to this. For instance, the trickle down economics is a theory that claims that benefits for the wealthy trickle down to everyone else. These benefits are tax cuts on businesses, high income earners, capital gains, and dividends, etc. The logic here is that this theory assumes that the upper class and rich industrialists and investors are the real drivers of economy. Thus, it also assumes they will use the extra money from tax costs to expand businesses and hire more workers, consequently allowing the money to trickle down to the workers who are the lower class in society. This, however, has not worked in practice. Historically, kings and emperors have always favored the rich and supported the rich financially. This has not changed till today. Global economic system is designed in this manner with Africa at the bottom, expecting the trickle down effect. On the other hand, it is interesting to note that arguments for good governance that dominate governance, literature and policy discussions essentially identify the importance of governance capacities that are necessary for ensuring, for ensuring the efficiency of markets. The basic assumption is that African nations can ensure efficient markets, particularly by enforcing property rights, the rule of law, reducing corruption, committing not to expatriate, private investors will drive economic growth and development. This approach is one that implicitly stresses the priority of developing markets, enhancing governance, and is currently dominant paradigm supported by international development and financial agencies. That means this international development and financial agencies support only this. If you are doing anything outside of it, they will not support you. The problem, however, is the fact that the successful implementation of these strategies require a complementary set of governance capacities, which most African nations lack because of foreign intervention. This is why the failure of these strategies in many African countries and their dramatic success in the small number of East Asian countries could not be satisfactorily explained at the instance of the rise of Asian tigers. Many of us quote Asian tigers that have risen you know, over a period of time like Prop did. However, we have observed that because of foreign intervention, African countries would not be able to follow the same track and rise up like them. And this paper will attempt to look at one or two issues that have prevented African economies from reinventing themselves, being resilient enough to take that same route. Now, to look at one or two theoretical positions that help explain this, we look at the secular cumulative causation theory. Having assessed this challenge in relation to the economic growth, one is inclined to perceive African under, underdevelopment within the frame or within the theoretical frame of the secular cumulative causation theory. This is a theory developed by the Swedish economist Gunnar Mida in the year 1956. Essentially, it's a multi-causal approach 
where the core variables and their linkages are delineated. It maintains that a change in one form of an institution will lead to successive changes in other institutions. These changes are secular in that they continue in a circle, many times in a negative way, in which there is no end, and cumulative in that they perish, they persist in each round. The change does not occur all at once, as that would lead to chaos. Rather, the changes occur gradually. This theory is factored in spread effect and bush backwash effect. And it is obvious that African countries fall within the backwash effect. The backwash effect are those effects emanating from the center of growth that discourages equivalent growth in other areas. Because of this rapid growth, in contrast to the stagnation of other regions, the center of growth for progressive regions attract net immigration from other parts of the country or the world. In this case, there's a net movement of population, capital, and goods in favor of the progressive regions, while the backward regions are continually denuded. This explains the influx of African immigrants into Europe and other Western countries, and the perpetual cycle of poverty and underdevelopment in Africa. Now, this means that this theory, you know, very, very conveniently captures what is happening within African economies, whereby we see a huge migration of uh, people labor from the denuded economies that are poor to Western economies that are already advanced. So we have a secular accumulation in the bad effects, not necessarily the good effects. So there's a secular accumulation there. Now, if we uh, relate this to human development, in the past decade, African nations posted shocking economic growth, leading pundits to estimate that Nigeria, Egypt, South Africa would remain in the 10 fastest growing economies in the world between 2014 and 2050. Currently, six of the 10 fastest growing economies are in Africa. And the big question, and the big question is, does economic growth translate into sustainable human development? To be more specific with Africa's economic growth, translate into human development. What can be sustained? In the current growth bazaar, another economic bubble that will likely burst soon, more importantly, can growth truly be factored as sustainable if the human element that engages the African populace is not represented? Patrick. 2014 expresses these reservations when he states that although oil abundance produces high growth, just like in Nigeria, it often benefits only a few corrupt elites rather than translating to higher living standards for most of the population. For instance, oil rich Angola is a case in point. Despite having one of the world's highest growth rates, one of the world's highest growth rates from 2005 to 2010, averaging some 17% annually, its cause on the Human Development Index remains a miserable 0.49. And its infant mortality rate was lower than the sub-Saharan uh, average. So that's really terrible. In spite of the increase in their income from oil, the Human Development Index is even lower, it's coming low. So can we call that sustainable development? I don't think so. The expansion of market economies alongside economic growth measured in high GDP and good performance private sectors are all theoretical indices of progress in modern economies. However, observable disparity between theory and reality in African conditions is what we, is, is that calls us for a rethink of our conceptualization of sustainable development. The International Institute of Sustainable Development defines SD as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to not only meet their own needs, but also create resilient economies. However, the economies, the economic policies that we have largely compelled, that we have largely been compelled by the West to adopt, will clearly result into secular cumulative causation effect on African nations. That means it will not bring about growth, but rather it will bring about a shift of our own capital, human capital, 
from African countries to the West, which is exactly what is happening right now. Consequently, sustainable human development should be the point of emphasis. This is the type of development that does not make expansion of markets and capital innovations as its central focus, but rather a symbiotic engagement with natural resources for sustainability. Climate change and increasing population have made the logic of wealth redundant if the exploitation of resources makes the environment uninhabitable. Water resources and arable land are dwindling in Africa and other parts of the world, thus making the survival of humanity itself the focus of development and not wealth. Our rethink of theoretical conceptualizations have clearly set the stage for interrogating the practical use or misuse of resources in order to arrive at what type of development Africans should seek. It is my submission that secular accumulation, cumulative causation is the African cause, which is a function of Africa's designation by the West as a feeder economy and insistence on maintaining the status quo, thus perpetuating the curse of secular cumulative causation. To this end, I'm inclined to postulate a variant of Midas theory, which is induced secular cumulative causation theory. In other words, Africa's position within this theory is induced, it's not natural. We are compelled by the West to remain redundant while all our resources are being you know, siphoned outside to Western nations. Africa. Now, at this point in time, let me just bear this out. Uh, some of us may have heard what happened recently to the Ghanaian currency. But this is a classic example of what we're experiencing as we're chasing development in Africa. The Ghanaian currency suddenly overnight lost its value to the tune of 45.1% overnight to the dollar. And what is the, the cause of this? Ghana's president made a bold proclamation in Switzerland that they are not going to be exporting cocoa to Switzerland or the EU again only 50% of their total exports will be going to Switzerland. Why? What brought about the trade uh, uh, conflict between Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and Europe? Because the entire value of the cocoa industry is $150 billion. And the entire West African countries that are involved in this particular economy only earn 6% of $150 billion. And they have not been complaining. But suddenly the EU says, that, well, because you are not environmentally friendly, we are going to put sanctions on you. So how do we solve the problem? To prevent the sanctions, the EU suggested that Ghana and other West African countries uh, buy what we call uh, ca carbon trading. That means you pay EU for not polluting. How can we pay you for not polluting? And then the Ghanaian president made this declaration, 50% of our, our exports are not going out. We are going to be refining and making chocolate in Ghana. Immediately he made this declaration, all the you know, uh, 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 credit rating institutions in the world, uh, S&P, Fitch and Middle, immediately lowered the credit rating of Ghana. Immediately lowered it from you know, mid risk to very high risk. And what that means is that Ghana will not be able to take loans because it's very difficult for them to finance those loans now. And then the Ghanaian currency is stabbed in the back, short. Somebody say prime, you know, summarily executed. So suddenly we see Ghana's currency going overnight, just going down. So if you as an African country decide that I want to revert governance, I want to be resilient, I want to be able to compete with the European economy, the mother you. This is what happened to Zimbabwe. When Zimbabwe decided that, okay, we're going to take back the land from the white people. They said, okay, and we saw what happened. Sanctions came from IMF, from the EU and the US, and the, the, the Zimbabwean dollar became, you know, that one is history, it became something else. So we are trying to look at some of the key essential issues that prevent residents and attack and attempt to reinvent governance in Africa. For the purpose of this paper, resource governance will be perceived as a sound exercise of political, economic, and administrative authority to manage a country's resource for development. Regardless, 
for our attempt to reinvent or rethink resource governance in Africa, we require a retrospective inquiry into historical antecedents that will enable a deeper understanding of the interplay between power, resources, and common good. This is the case because African resources have not always remained under the power of Africans, or in more recent times have been controlled by other powers by proxy. There is no economic indices by which one can measure the performance of African economies in pre-colonial era. As a consequence of this, it is very difficult to make comparative analysis and measure growth and development during this period. Regardless, it is safe to say that these societies met a certain standard of living which early visitors to the continent did not peg as poor. Early European writers rather described African societies as simple, communal, and mostly agrarian and primitive in nature. It is important to observe that the concept of primitivity as espoused, as espoused by early European visitors did not presuppose growth under development. That means before the coming of Europeans, Africa was not underdeveloped. So the whole concept of underdevelopment, which we are trying to address here now, is something that came after colonialism. So Africa was never underdeveloped. More importantly, Christopher Eret, a UCLA professor of African history and author of Civilizations of Africa, has consistently maintained that rather than being backward, Africa is in pre-colonial times was rich in civilization, technology, and social development. It is, however, interesting to note that Europe's possession of Africa as a dark continent did not include these resources. When they classified Africa as a dark continent, they didn't say your resources were dark. They didn't say the gold was dark. They didn't say the diamonds were dark, right? On the contrary, African resources were characterized in a glowing, albeit legendary and mythical way. That means in Europe, they, they classified African resources as wow. It's, it's just like heaven, let's make sure we get there. So that is the way they perceived Africa before colonization. The dismissal of the dependentist theory by scholars, people who say, oh, no, you know, we should forget about colonialism, it is not what is affecting us. The dismissal of this dependency theory by many scholars as a mere blame game has become increasingly untenable given the intricacies of the underdevelopment quagmire rather than refer to Africa's development problems in terms of absolute culpability by other Africans themselves or the West, it has become clear that each indices of underdevelopment is rooted in a unique factor of its own. The aggregate of all these factors create a summation of how Africa's underdevelopment problems should be perceived. The reality of this summation does not suggest self-destruction as the prime mover of the, develop, the underdevelopment process, but rather the conniving forces at play over the centuries of resource exploitation. I have very little time, so I'm going to round this up now. Now, reinventing the governance of human capital is critical in shifting outside the box that colonial legacies place African economies in. The same manner in which human labor was governed in the colonial era is the same philosophy that pervades labor governance today by African administrators. Foreign firms from China, India, Lebanon, ETC carry out forced labor, slave labor, like work regimes, which tacitly endorsed, which is tacitly endorsed by African government. Consequently, labor under these conditions have developed a classic slave mentality alongside an unconscious act of subtle sabotage of the system as a form of resistance. Now, this is clear because most of Africa's education during the colonial period was outsourced. That's the reason why we have you know, industrial action now in uh, our universities, because the government inherited from colonialism the fact that government does not invest in education, but rather outsources it out. So from that time to now, government does not see it as its responsibility to do what? To fund education, because it is a colonial mentality. The colonial masters never funded education. They outsource it to churches. They outsource it to other groups of uh, people and the government has taken over that mentality. That mentality needs to be reinvented in order for us to have resilient and sustainable systems. Finally, in conclusion, I would like to look at
please permit me to look at our oil, natural uh, resources. The vast majority of African oil feeds, gold and diamond mines and huge mineral extraction rights are all run by foreign firms. He who pays the piper dictates the tune. African leaders are the puppets dancing the tune of its international resource controllers. The reason why Africans cannot be allowed to control their resources is very clear to the West. However, we seem not to have caught up to this fact. As of 2020, sub-Saharan nations had an external debt of over $702 billion. Now, money going into Africa annually from loans, remittances, and aid amount to up $161 billion. However, in contrast to this figure, we have $203 billion leaving the continent annually. Some of these in direct, such as 68 billion in mainly Dodge taxes, essentially multinational corporations legally steal much of this by pretending that they are really generating their wealth in tax havens. These are so-called illicit financial flows amount to around 6.1% of the continent's entire gross domestic product or three times what Africa receives in aid. Then there's 30 billion that these corporations repatriate profits that make in, they make in Africa be sent back to their home countries or elsewhere to enjoy their wealth. Thus, rethinking resource governance means rethinking actual ownership, which settles the question of accountability. Are we actually governing our resources? We are not. So how do we become accountable for what you don't govern? The gold mines, the diamond mines, the oil mines, everything is governed by multinationals from abroad. So rethinking the entire structure, reinventing the entire structure of resource governance will put us on a sound footing as a continent, not just a nation of Nigeria, to be able to have political legitimacy. As a word of conclusion, I've not been able to go through the entire paper, but as a word of conclusion, I submitted to the entire conference that will be looking at several aspects of governance, sustainability, and uh, uh, accountability. I submitted to the conference that they should attempt to interrogate manners or strategies in which the entire educational system has to be overhauled because governance is carried out by politics. Like Prof said, it is politicians that make the decisions. And the decisions that are made come from a certain paradigm of thought. If education is not prepared in such a way to think, to rethink, and to change the paradigm of thought of Nigerian administrations, then it is not possible to reinvent Nigeria. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Ben Fianca representative of Professor Tony Akinlo for that very wonderful uh, neat paper. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> While the lead paper was uh, ongoing, uh, a former dean of the Faculty of Heart here, Professor Bumisala Adilti, uh, came into the hall. Uh, also, also, an illustrious alum of this university, uh, a one-time deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, in person of, if you want to clap for him, you can please clap for him. In the person of Chief Adibayo Adilabu, uh, he came into the hall.
and um, is today a politician and the flag bearer, flag bearer of the Accord Party in the forthcoming gubernatorial election in Oyo State. He came in with um, a retinue of eight. Um, he has a chief Adibwe Gadi Guke, uh, DG, Accord um, Hoyo Campaign Council. Oh, he's, he's, another, he's another alumnus, a round of applause for him. He's an effect, he's, he's an ex effect too. Um, um, I have Honorable Benga Olayemi Ariba, stand for recognition too. Um, Mr. Femi Adebayo, please stand for recognition. Is another effect. Oh, he said Mr. Femi Adebayo is his own classmate here in Ife. Mr. Bukola Wofiroye, I consider as the son of the soil. Mr. Boye Akonde, please stand for recognition. Mr. Ayo Alade, or Alade. Abbe Solomon, Mr. Oduola Bade, Comrade Femi Aoboro, and he has lots of his protocol officers here. Let's clap for him once again. And um, Chief Vadebayo Adelabu, I say a big welcome home to you. Right now, I have been asked to announce a slight alteration to the program of event. We'll be going straight uh, with the kind permission of the Vice Chancellor, represented by the DVC Academic here. Um, all right, I have been asked to announce I'll be going straight to the awards. And afterwards, I will first take a first set of awards. And this is the format it will take. Uh, each of the recipients, if they have um anything to say to us um they have a minute or so to to respond um after that um i i believe um, i was told the vice chancellor uh will soon be taking uh, his leave of um, this event so as not to keep the vice chancellor unnecessarily um waiting we'll go straight to the awards um, right now um the first person i will call before we uh, start taking uh, those of our invited guests is um professor willie aladi Fawoli, the keynote presenter of today uh, professor Fawoli, uh, please stand and um you have that one um Uh, Miss Doctor, sorry, Doctor Bureau, please. Come. May I request the person to take Professor Waoli's citation to please um, uh, step out, step forward here. Who is taking Professor Waoli's citation? Dr. Shambade, is it you? Dr. Abiru has decided to take it himself. Uh, yes, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here to take up this responsibility. Standing before all of us is Professor W. Yaladi Fawali. Wow, attended Amadou Bilo University, Zaria, 70, 1974 to 1978. A BS in political science, University of Ife, now above a law university in Ife. And he obtained his master's in general relations from the George Washington University, Washington, D.C., United States of America. 
That's about 30 years ago. And he has a Master of Philosophy and Doctor of Philosophy in the field of Political Science, specializing in international relations. So I briefly made this confession. I specifically requested for Professor Fowley's keynote address because we're talking about democratic backsliding. And that happens to be the area I'm presently working on. So I have special interest in what he presented. Thank you, Prof, for taking the leadership always. So Professor Fowley joined the Academic Staff University of Ife as an lecturer in 1983. That was before I was born anyway. So you can start to guess my age, it's a free world. And rose steadily through the ranks to full professor of international relations in 2003, October. That was about 20 years ago. So during his career as a lecturer, he has served the university in various capacities. No wonder he recognized the ASU chairman. Professor Fowley served as secretary, ASU, 1995 to 2000. Professor Fowley served as head of department, international relations, 2006-2008. Member of Senate, 2003 till date. Congratulations, Prof. Then, as Dean, Faculty of Administration, 2008-2010. Professor Fawoli has served as Member of Governing Council of Wapimola University, Ileife, 2003-2007. Chairman Standing Committee of Congregation, 2003-2007. Professor Fawoli has also served as Chairman, Joint Council Senate Panel on the Review and Harmonization of Statutory Committees in the University among other responsibilities. Outside of Yabafi University, Professor Faoli has served as visiting lecturer at the University of Ibado, 1998 to 1999. Visiting professor of Houston University, Okuku Campus, 2010 to 2011. Visiting professor, Bowen University, Iwo Road, Iwo, 2019 to 2019. Visiting research fellow, African Studies Center and University of Lady in Netherlands in 2000. He has also been external examiner at the University of Ibadan, Lagos, University of Ibadan, University of Lagos, University of Joss, University of Adekiti, now Ekiti State University, Akumba Akoko in Nigeria. Prof has also served in many universities outside this country, University of Ghana, Legon, Accra, and Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy, also in Ghana. He's a resource person and editor, Codestria. Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, Dakar, Senegal. He was member of the Governing Board, Administrative Staff College of Nigeria, ASCON, Badagri, 2008-2010. I guess that was during the period where Professor Fawoli served as Dean of the Faculty. So Professor Fawoli belongs to several academic bodies. Nigerian Political Science Association, where I also belong to, Nigerian Society of International Affairs, African Association of Political Science, International Political Science Association, Society for International Relations Awareness, among others. Prof has delivered scholarly lectures at many of Nigeria's prestigious institutions, including the Nigerian Defense College, formerly Nigerian War College, Abuja. That's Nigeria's highest military institution since 2005. The National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, NIP, NIPSS, Kuru, JOS. 2010 and 2021. Professor Faoli has attended and delivered scholarly papers at numerous academic conferences, seminars, and workshops across Nigeria and in several countries in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. Professor Faoli has authored, edited, and published four major textbooks, three research monographs, co edited six books. He has published to his more than 70 journal articles and book chapters at home and abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to introduce to you Professor William Aladefa Wale. May I ask the representative of the Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Vice Chancellor at um, Academic to step forward to present this award. Uh, she will be supported by the Dean, Faculty of Administration. Yes, yes. Uh, you support, you are going to support the vice chancellor. On behalf of the faculty of administration, I present this award of excellence and appreciation 
to Professor W.A. Fawole as keynote speaker at the 2022 Faculty of Administration Conference this day, 29th of November, 2022. Congratulations, sir. Standing on existing protocols again, I want to appreciate the Vice Chancellor ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Admin who has stepped out. I want to appreciate the Dean of the Faculty, Professor Funshu Adishola, uh, for his humility, for his leadership, and for the fact that, as I said in the beginning, Without the dean's approval, I would not have been invited to be a guest speaker. And I really appreciate uh, the faculty for giving me the privilege to speak at this occasion. I also want to appreciate the dean and the entire faculty staff and the local organizing committee, because it has been a Herculean task planning a conference of an international nature. And then there was this intervening uh, variable, the long drone strike, and that they are able to do it not long after the strike is over is exemplary. And I want to thank the chairperson and all the members, and I appreciate the faculty. And I promise to serve the faculty more. Make that louder, please. I'd like to call on Dr. Ben Fianca, who is representing the Vice Chancellor of Regimas University, Professor Tony Akinlo here, to just step forward to collect his award. We've already taken the citation of Professor Akinlo, so there's no need to repeat it. Um, I'll call on I'll call on the the DVC card again to yes, ma'am. You are going to take all you present all the awards here today. With, with the kind permission of the Vice Chancellor. She will be supported as usual uh, by the team. Professor Funcho On behalf of Faculty of Administration, I want to present this award of excellence and appreciation to you, sir, Professor E. Akilo, ably represented by Dr. Fianca the Vice Chancellor of Udimaz University in Hede as lead paper presenter. Thank you very much, sir. Congratulations. Well, as you share, um, Dr. Bianca will say, Dr. Fianca will say something, um, or a word of appreciation on behalf of uh, Professor Kinlo. On behalf of my boss, uh, Professor Anthony Emisa Akino, I'd like to appreciate the Vice Chancellor, the management team, the entire faculty of administration and the university as a whole for honoring him uh, in this uh, manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I would like to call on Mr. Adegoki Sunday Omoni, the Auditor General of the Sunshine, Sunshine State. On those states to step forward uh, to collect his um, his award, Doctor Odewale, where are you, please? Doctor, I can, I can, I can see your hairs are assured. <laughs> he will be presenting the citation of Mr. Adegoki Omoni. Thank you. Standing on the system protocol, 
Okay. This is the citation for Mr. Adego Kisondi Omani, the Auditor General for the Government of Ondo State. Mr. Adegoke was born on the 2nd of March, 1969 in Ajagba, the really local government of Ondo State. He's an alumni of uh, Obafemi Awolowo University, Laife. He got his first degree in accounting in this Saturday of learning in 1992. His master degree in business administration in 2012. He's currently rounding up his master's of science, MSc, in accounting. Mr. Adegok is an uh, associate member of Chartered Institute of Taxation, fellow Institute of Chartered Accountant of Nigeria. He's also a certified forensic accountant, Institute of Chartered Accountant. Mr. Adegok has served in various managerial capacity, particularly in public sector since 1996. He was the head of internal audits in Ondo State Local Government Service Commission between October 1996 to December 2002. Assistant Chief Accountant at the Federal University of Technology, Akure, Ondose, between January 2003 to December 2003. He was the Deputy Director in Ondo State Board of Internal Revenue between January 2004 to December 2007, and later became the Director of that uh, board between January 2008 and to January 20, July 2008. Currently, Mr. Adoke Sunday. Omani is the Auditor General for Ondo State Government. A position he has been occupying since August 2008. He has been occupying that position since 2008. He's not just ordinary Auditor General, but with experience. Mr. Adoke has delivered more than 50 papers in conferences and seminars across the nation of the world. He has also served on those states and the nation at different committees, which include Member Steering Committee on Public Governance Reform and Development Projects, the World Bank sponsored between 2009 to 2017. He was a member on those state Development Policy and Implementation Committee. He was also on uh, those state Steering Committee on Implementation on the International Public Sector Accounting since 2015 till date. He's also a member steering committee on the implementation of public procurement reform between 2019 to date, and chairman state committee on verification of state uh, government debts 2021. He's a member of federation account. He's, he's also called, he's also served as a member in federation account allocation committee subcommittee on implementation of inter international public sector accounting standard in Nigeria. He was a secretary. Body of Federal and State Auditor General between December 2013 to May 2022. He's now the currently the acting chairman, Body of Federal and State Auditor General till date. He has occupied that position between May and till date. He's a member of the steering committee on state fiscal transparency, accountability, and sustainability between 2018 to date. Mr. Adegok is a devoted Christian and also serves as a um, he served as patron and guard patron to several Christians and secular organizations. He was a treasurer of Methodist Church, Nigeria, Ak Diocese of Elisha. He was a lay coordinator of Evangelism Methodist Church of Nigeria. Currently, he's also a diocesan lay president elect, Methodist Church of Nigeria, till death. He has received uh, over 20 awards from different organizations, which include the Merit Award by the Nigerian University Account Accounting Student Association, Adekunle Ajayasi University, Akumba Akoko. Also, Merit Award from the Institute of Chartered Accounts of Nigeria, Haikan, Western Zone. Award of Excellence of Leadership and Productivity Compliance by the National Productivity Center, Abuja, 2021. He also received a Doctor of Public Administration, London Bridge Institute, in conjunction with the African Institute of Public Administration, December 2019, among others award. Mr. Adegoke is married to barista Mrs. Uh, Stella Adegoke. And the marriage is blessed uh, with children. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Join me as I present to you, Mr. Adoki Sunday Omani, the Auditor General for the Government of Ondo State. Thank you. I will request the, oh, uh, just before I, with the kind permission of the Vice Chancellor, I would like to recognize the presence of the Head of Management and Accounting, Professor Grace Akinola. Stand for recognition. You're welcome. I will call on the Vice Chancellor now, represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, to step forward and present Mr. Vigo. Thank you very much. For this set of award, I was made to know that the two sets of award, the first one we did was like internal. Professor Fawale, one of us, Professor Akinla, one of us. The second set is for the alumni. And because of this, I want to ask the principal officers that are around to join me too. Okay, the library is there. The registrar is outside. So when she comes in, she should join us. And the wife should also come up. From the sunshine state. I want sun to shine the more in Hoeju. We want brightness more in Hoeju. Because of this award, so we should experience more of brightness. Okay, so you finish from here. Ah, okay, that's double, double shyness. of administration and on behalf of the vice chancellor i want to present this award of excellence to mr sunday omoni adegoke a worthy alumnus of this university for your outstanding performance in civil service and commitment to scholarly and institutional growth this day 29th of november 2022 congratulations sir. <laughs> The Vice Chancellor of Bafema Wolowo University, ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor. Uh, let me just adopt the already established uh, protocol. But without uh, failing, I mean, I must not fail to acknowledge the Dean, Faculty of Administration. That is our own Dean. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, the head of department, management and accounting, Professor Zakiola, please let me just be biased. <laughs> yeah, I recognize Ma. And I must please recognize Professor Mrs. Akin Law for two special reasons. Who are classmates here? <laughs> and uh, we also took her to Ondo State. This is a wife to my uncle. So. <laughs> So she's taking good care of us. I must recognize her. Thank you very much. And I must also recognize one of the award recipients who was my classmates too. That's Chisho Adilabu. <laughs> we, we both finished 92 in our county here. So it's a good thing for us. It's a good thing for me. I must say I'm deeply privileged. I'm highly privileged and deeply honored at least to receive this award. Uh, is, is a special award to me. If I made me in all ramifications. 
And that's why I have kept coming back. All academic degrees I've awarded in this world, they were all here in Ife. And I'm still on it. So I so much cherish the award. And on behalf of myself, my family, I want to appreciate the faculty, appreciate the university, my department, and all the staff and students of this great university. May God continue to lift the university upward. In our own little way, we'll continue to support the university. It's our own, and God will see us through. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Right now, I I will be calling on and just before I call the next um, honoree, I would like to recognize the presence of some alumni of uh, the Department of Management and Accounting who are here of the Faculty of Administration. I've just been corrected. Right. <laughs> Mr. Janidio Olale, uh, please stand up for recognition. Mr. Oluwashin Owojori, stand for recognition. I, I've been told he went, stepped out. Dr. Shade Akiyemi uh, stepped out. And Mr. Oluwa Tosin Ajaja. Tosin Ajaja, where are you? Okay. Anyway, um, please join me in as, I, as I welcome um uh, chief adebayo adelabu um uh, upstage as he receives his own award please a round of applause for him and i'll be calling on dr ibokwe to step forward to present his citation dr ibokwe Very short. Thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, well, um, <laughs> I, I want to stand on the already established protocol. But before I do that, for want of time, please permit me to recognize the Vice Chancellor, our amazing Dean, the Librarian, Professor Fawali, and our distinguished dignitaries. And more importantly, I want to appreciate our awesome students. I have been asked to do an abridged version of the citation for a very great personality. It is a very difficult task. I don't know how to cut this into bits and pieces, but I promise you because I don't want to take more of your time. I said, I don't want to take more of your time. Not that I don't want to waste your time because this is really great. So I would have loved to go the whole hog, but then they said I should do an abridged version. So I'm greatly honored to be here to present this citation. I want to thank especially the LOC. Thank you for giving me this amazing opportunity. Welcome, sir. Chief Adelabu Adekola, FCA. Adepayo Adekola Adelabu, FCA, FCIB is a direct grandson of the Alaji Honorable Adegoke Adelabu, popularly known as the 
this is amazing. Please clap for him again. Now, if you have the program, you will see that I'm skipping one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I'm going straight to the last portion of this. But this is very important. He lost his father in 1975 at a tender age of four. Therefore, he was brought up by his paternal grandmother. With his six other siblings, growing up was a very was very tough as the old grandmother, who happened to be a petty trader, had seven children to cater for as their father was her only child. Chief Adelabu grew up selling different kinds of commodities on the streets to assist his grandmother. In spite of these tough circumstances, In spite of these tough, very tough circumstances, he was determined to break the jinx of poverty by ensuring that he went to school at all costs, where he came out with flying colors. This also afforded him the opportunity to be conversant with all the nooks and crannies of Ibadan, his town, and the entire Oyo state. Chief Adebayo Adelabu had his primary school education in Ibadan. His secondary school education in Lagelu Grammar School, Ibadan, between 1982 and 1987, with distinctions. He later proceeded to Obafemi University between 1988 and 1992 to study accounting. Of course, what do you expect from somebody who did all his trading on the streets? He graduated in 1992 with a first class honors. I salute you, sir. A first class honors degree in accounting. Yes, OAU. He passed the final qualification exam of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. I can. And yes, really, I can. And was admitted as an associate member of the Institute in 1996. Therefore, he's a chartered accountant with over 26 years post-qualification experience. He is currently a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, FCA, and Chartered Institute of Bankers, FCIB. He's also an associate member of the Institute of Directors of Nigeria and the UK, as well as a member of the United States Institute of It is loaded, very loaded. And you know, I skipped seven paragraphs to get to this. So imagine what we had in the seven paragraphs. So I will still skip some and quickly move to, so that we'll just, we'll just let him sit down. He's too big to be standing for too long. He has attended various local and international training and seminars, including the famous University of London Institute of Management Development, the Euromoney Institute, and the University of London Institute of Management still. He also has attended the Institute of Internal Auditors, Orlando, Florida, 
Harvard Business School, Boston, Wanton Business School, Pennsylvania, Stanford Business School, California, Kellogg Executive School, Evington, Chicago, and Columbia University Business Schools, New York, all in the United States of America. It has almost done the 50 states. Chief Adelabu started his professional training with the international audit and consulting firm, Prince Waterhouse, now Prince Waterhouse Coppers, and rose to the position of audit manager and senior consultant before resigning in year 2000 to join the banking industry. He later joined First Atlantic Bank PLC in September 2000 as a financial controller and later chief inspector of the bank. He left the bank in July 2003 to join First Bank. He joined First Bank as deputy financial controller and later pioneer head of budget and performance management department, a position he held till September 2007 when he left to join Standard Chartered Bank Limited. At, Start at Chartered Bank Limited, he was a general manager and West African regional head of finance for consumer banking. In November, yes, only him. In November 2009, in November 2009, ah, see what great effect is producing, for goodness sake. In November 2009, Chief Adilabu was reinvented and reinvited by First Bank PLC as the group financial controller and later on, Executive Director, Chief Financial Officer, CFO, and a member of the Board of Directors of the bank. On 20 February 2014, the then president appointed Chief Adelabu as Deputy Governor of Central Bank of Nigeria. Mm. He resumed CBN as deputy governor, financial system stability, but later redeployed as the deputy, deputy governor of corporate services. He left the central bank as the deputy governor operations. While at CBN, he was the chairman, board of directors of the NIBBS and F. Or oh, some students, you're too much. <laughs> and also a director on the board of Nigeria Security Printing and Minting Company, Assets Management Company of Nigeria, Amcon, as well as NIRSAL. Okay. In 2010, Chief Adelabu was conferred with the Distinguished Fellow Award of the Central Council of Ibadan Indigens, CC, and was also honored with the chieftaincy title of Kabesio. By the Olubadan of Ibadan land, Oba Dr. Samuel Odulanam. Thank you. He was also installed area arrest. <laughs> now I have a confession to make. On a good day, with English as a first degree, I meant to go over this over and over, and then I just speak to it. Actually, this is not the citation I was meant to take. Yes, it wasn't the right. <laughs> so I have no reason to miss any of these things. I've lived in Ife longer than I stayed anywhere in my life. So I should be able to pronounce this as well. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I actually did not know I was reading a citation of a Kabiesi. Kabiesi. All right. 
So I'll round it off here now. He has consciously focused his entrepreneurial activities on Ibadan and Oyo State at large, which in addition to enriching the city's skyline have empowered and created jobs for the state's indigenous and residents. His drive focuses on rare estate, hospitality, and agriculture, with over 3,000 employees on his monthly payroll. In addition to thousands of indirect employment through supplies and services, he is the owner of Base One Properties, Base Hospitality and Entertainment Limited, Base One Farms, Chief Adelabu's Philanthropic Intervention through Bio Adelabu Foundation, BAF, in the area of education, health, and other forms of social support have also added meaning to the lives of several people, as well as replacing the frowns on, the faces, on their faces with many smiles. You have beyond, <laughs> beyond job creation and boosting local economy. He also has a platform to develop the capacity of others, especially young people, through mentoring and youth development activities. He's a member of Ikoyi Club, 1938, Jericho Businessmen's Club, Ibadan Golf Club, of course, he's married to Olusheyi Omolara, and they are blessed with children. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to present one of the very best, a perfect gentleman, Chief Adelabu. Thank you very much. There is nothing else to add. We have actually caught a very big fish today. Yes, a very big fish. So I'll call the Vice Chancellor, will be represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic to step uh, forward to present his award. Um, she'll be supported by the Dean, Professor Kusho, and the Registrar, the representative of the Registrar, the Barrister Runke Ajibola. the faculty of administration and the vice chancellor professor Adebayosini I present this award of excellence to Chief Adebayo Adekola Adelabu Benkelemes for your contribution to scholarship, institutional development and illustrious performance in leadership and politics this day 29th of November 2022. Congratulations sir.
<laughs> you know, you know when you give uh, politicians two minutes, you know what that means. <laughs> you don't had it. It's eleven minutes, not two. Thank you. Great effect. Great effect. Great of the greatest of the greatest of greatest. Uh, thank you, thank you so so much. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, I don't know whether it has changed how you guys do it now, but that's how we used to do it then. Um, I'm so happy today. I'm so glad to be in your midst once again. Um, I will also join others in uh, relying on the already established protocols, but that is not without mentioning my due regards and greetings to the Vice Chancellor, duly represented by the our able Deputy VC, uh, my Dean of the Faculty, uh, the Registrar, the Librarian, I don't know if the boss is here too, then um, all the eminent personalities here seated, my HOD, Professor Akiola, and my dear uh, Aburi Shade, What's the first name again? Inka Aburi Shade, now Inka Akilo. <laughs> Good to see you again after how many years? This is over 30 years now. Yes, then our uh, awesome students of the greatest university, OAU. I feel so humbled, I feel so honored. Um, like they say, there's no honor that is greater than honor at home. This is my home and I value this honor so much. Um, before I go on, like I said, my two minutes is 11 minutes, but one plus one in politics, remove the addition, just put the one by the side, it's 11, <laughs> not two. I would also like to recognize I mean, I'll call them my friends growing up. Nobody knew where we were going to get to then. We were in class together. I mean, number one, I will give recognition to his Professor Inka Akinlo. I'm happy to see you. I thank God for your life. Uh, where he's taking you to is higher. Thank God. Then Femi Adibayo, who was also a classmate then, today, is the MD CEO of FTI Asset Management Limited. That's after having gone through all the banks in Nigeria, he has his own no, non-bank financial institution now. Uh, then I have my Diabukola Au Fionoyi, who was also in our class. Uh, boys have grown to be men now. We thank God. Then my very good brother. Uloye Agba from Ibadan. Uloye Adego Yega Adego Ke. We, we also graduated the same year that he finished from Agri Economics in Ife here. Today is on the lineage to become Olubad of Ibadan. He's the Areodi Babalogun of Ibadan land. He was, a, he, was, he was a director in Ohando Oil Services. Now is the director in OES Energy Services and is the chairman of Solutions FM in Ibadan. Yes. Coincidentally, today is the director general of my campaign for 2023 accord. Then, Mr. Winga Olayemi Ariba, our dear leader in our political party. Please stand up for recognition. Thank you so much for, for that. Like I said, I give thanks to the Almighty Allah for taking us thus far. We never knew where it was taking us to. So my first uh, gratitude will go to Almighty God for seeing us through and making us to be alive to witness an event like this for today. Then my next gratitude goes to this school. It's an amazing school. Is a school, you know what they call evergreen. 
you get there and you remember those good memories huh? of our years of roaming the school, attending classes, playing with friends, and enjoying the beauty of these schools. Man is a product of nature and nurture. Nature is from God. Whatever you become, God has destined you to, to become it. But nurture is what God has used to actually achieve a fulfillment of your destiny. This school is a major instrument in my life. And I'm ever grateful to Obafemi Awolo University for nurturing me to become what I am today. I can say that beyond, I mean, after my parents, this school is next. And I'm thankful to the school. I am thankful to our faculty, from our dean, our HOD, all the lecturers and the students for counting me worthy of this honor today. Like I said, the greatest honor is honor at home. I value it greatly. Because like Yulbas will say, Allah Ramba Shewani Adaranita, Madarani Ile. And like they say, that charity begins at home. Ile Latinko, Eshoro De. I value this award so much. And I'm grateful for this award. Uh, by God's grace, this university will never come down. Yes. Uh, even last month, too, in Ibadan, in fact, Goiga was the chairman of the occasion. The OAU alumni Ibadan branch also gave me an award after my confinement. Uh, the officer of the Federal Republic by the president, Buari OFR in Abuja then. So I'm so honored. Anytime I get an award from anything, OAU, be it alumni, the department, the faculty, I, I actually hold it in very high esteem. Uh, but it's, it would be nice for me to just give a note of gratitude without letting you know why I am into politics. Because when they mention, okay, an accountant, an auditor, a banker, deputy governor, central bank, you will not expect me to be in my suits and my tie and everything. But unfortunately, eh? I mean, this flowing, I'll be <laughs> I'll be converted from being a finance professional to a politician. And you keep wondering, ah, why is he into politics? Why is he a gentleman? Is this, is that? I just felt I need to give a little explanation and why we all must show interest in politics. There are various levels. Thank you. There are various levels of politics that we must participate, not necessarily as, as, as parents, because in my profession, which is accounting, finance, and banking, which is my training from school and to every place where I've worked, I've consulted before. As an accounting consultant, finance cons business consultant in Pricewaterhouse, the Pricewaterhouse Coopers. Then I have operated as a banker. I've worked in the small Nigerian bank, First Atlantic Bank. I've worked in the largest Nigerian local bank, First Bank of Nigeria. I've worked in a national bank, and a chartered bank. It's no more than three. Having consulted, operated, then I have regulated as a central bank deputy governor. There's nothing apart from those three. Nothing new again. So, but it always dawns on me that after you have tried for yourself to a level and God, God has answered your prayer, you don't have to be a billionaire. Just be comfortable. Break the poverty chains. You must now look at your community. Yes. No. It is not good. We have to look at the society because that is where we live. We are not an island. And the only way you can influence the society is to partake in politics. Fine, philanthropy is good, but there's a limit where you can extend your post to. How much do you have? How many people do you want to impact? How much do you want to, how many people do you want to give scholarships to? How many people do you want to train in vocational study, training and all that? It is limited, it is restricted to your post. Now we have the platform of government. You can reach more and more people by influencing the people. Three levels of participation in politics. 
the least expected is for you to be a registered voter. So you can actually decide who wants to be your leader. You don't just complain if you are not part of that process. You have to register and be able to vote for the person of your choice. The next level is to be a registered member of a registered political party. When you are a party member, are you able to decide right from nomination at the primary who you want to put forward to represent your party as a candidate? Then the last one, which is the most difficult, is to be an aspirant. If you don't have a little money, it is tough for you to do that. But I will implore everybody to show interest in politics. We should not complain again if you are not participating. Professor Akin Law's representative mentioned something about neocolonialism, neo all these white guys influencing us and dictating for us. They will dictate for us because we are not taking part in changing our own story locally. During the colonial era, they came here to colonize us. We resisted them, but they still conquered us. After independence, they went to their country. They were colonizing us from their country through the schools, through education, through music, through everything. We were following them. But now, my brother and sister, we are taking ourselves there. Yes, we are taking ourselves there. So it is getting worse. The only way we can change our story is to participate in governance because <laughs> it is it is so 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 ridiculous that these white guys they will continue to be what they are unless we deliver and liberate ourselves nigeria will be better i am so confident inshallah let's clap for nigeria we have the potentials to be better our problem is leadership once we get the leadership right then everything will turn around for the better. We have traveled all over the world. We we'll go to UK, we we'll go to US, we are going on vacation, two weeks vacation. We'll come back, we had a good life. Some people were born there. They leave their January 1 to December 31. And I'm telling you that seven things they do for their, their people, security, agriculture, environment, education, healthcare. I just implore of us, let's participate in politics and our country will be better for it. Thank you very much. I appreciate. As Alia mentioned, um, I announced an alteration to the program of event. Um, we have taken four of uh, the awards already. And, but before the vice chancellor will take his lead, um, I think it's appropriate that we'll have a group photograph with all awardees here. Uh, so I'm going to call up stage all the awardees, uh, those who have received and those who haven't received and are being represented here. Um, all awardees, please uh, step on stage again. Chivade Labu, uh, please come back on stage. Uh, Professor Faole, please. Um, Dr. Ben Fianca. Uh, Mrs. Ajibola, please step forward. Uh, the Vice Chancellor. Dr. Faraday, please.
हेलो आई वु लाइक टू अपोलोजाइज टू चीव अडिलाबु फॉर्म बी आफ अवर स्टूडेंट वॉट इज सो वर्ल्ड स्पीकिंग एंड दे वर स्टेपिंग हाउट इन एक्चुअल फैक्ट दे 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 हैव ए क्लास नाउ बट आव हैड दी अश्योरेंस ऑफ दी डीन दैट ई वुड स्पीक विथ विथ लेक्चर एज इन चार्ज आई थिंक दे सर यू हैव फिलोसॉफी एंड सोशियोलॉजी so please on their behalf i i on i know you understand uh, very well so the rest of the students that are here please um do not worry uh, your dean will intervene um remain seated while we conclude um this program it is for you uh, you don't worry there is at at is at time 7 there is at time 7 don't worry at time 7 is on me don't worry I I have my dean here. All right, uh we'll continue with with the program and I will be taking the very first uh workshop paper. Um I would like to invite uh the presenter Professor Saidu Oseni to uh step forward to come to the podium um for his uh Would you need this? Yes, I'm I'm at this microphone I need. Yes, I'm looking. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocols duly observed. The Vice Chancellor, who was ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, the DVC admin, all the principal officers, dean of the faculty, the host. Thank you for the adjustment. all the awardees are congratulated our professors our colleagues great efforts students this is the first in the series for the workshop and i want to thank the organizers for making the adjustment please there is another program that needs my attention okay now i have was invited to speak on tips for research grants and as part of the background for that okay as part of the background we have the outline as indicated and this is a real take home for our colleagues because grants drive research and research drive visibility and ranking for the institution so we have a brief outline that covers the background as well as the tips for the grants and then some reflections we we are going to start with an appetizer we have a slide that covers the major granting agencies in the whole world but these granting agencies were customized for the faculty of administration for a good reason why did we introduce this as the appetizer for several reasons number 1 these agencies carry global currencies for grants for every higher education institution meaning that if you look at the ranking of universities in africa if you look at selenbosch pretoria university of johannesburg the ranking is tied to their affiliations with these granting agencies and in this room for the faculty of administration in this room we have evidence of grantees from codestria 
and grantees from Fulbright, as well as grantees from the National Research Fund of the Third Fund. They are in this room. But we want more. That is not good enough. We don't want the case of a first generation university like OAU to be a story of once upon a time. We want a case of consistency in access to these grants. So we deliberately started this as the appetizer, meaning that the ranking of every institution globally is the rank, is the degree of affiliation with these granting agencies. And I'm, ve I'm very proud to mention those examples for Fulbright, for the case of the Department of Interrail, and the case of NRF, Third Fund, for the case of management and accounting. Now, this is the background to grants and grantsmanship. The definition is very clear. What is grantsmanship? The artistry for securing competitive grants for research. And this is directly tied to the ranking of every institution in the world. So what is the definition of that? For example, what is that process for securing grants? So we have two definitions indicated there. We already have all manners of categories of grants. Any funding that drives scholarship is a grant, a loose definition of a grant. And that is particularly important for our students and for our younger colleagues too. We have a long list from travel grant to conference grant. And I want to ask if there was a grant for hosting this event, because elsewhere, every academic or scholarly drive is based on grants and grantsmanship. So we have a long list, book grant, equipment grant, mobility grant, R&D grant, mega grant, ETC. So the question now is, we look at the background in this part of the world. If you look at the ranking, whether the Times Higher Education ranking or the Quaquarelli Synod ranking, this is directly tied to the extent to which an institution leverages on the opportunities provided by grants. And our record in this part of Sub-Saharan Africa is not very impressive. In the process, we end up missing out on millions of dollars of funding for all manners of grants. For example, while I mentioned some cases from Interrail, E.G. Fulbright, again, another case from Inter, uh, case of Cordestria, Cordestria at multiple scale, Cordestria for thesis writing grants, and then there's, there's the Cordestria mentorship, which uh, Professor Fawale mentioned. So we have all these opportunities. These are very clear to us about what we miss out. But then an opportunity provided by this forum is a way to redress this. Okay. Now, this was taken from the CV for OAU format. This is the CV. And under section three, we have three A, B, C. What is C? Research grant. Shockingly, we want that section to be populated with the names of those logos that were previously shown. For example, if you look at, in terms of benchmarking, if we look at our colleagues from, again, University of Johannesburg, University of Pretoria, the same department, pick a department like public administration or management and accounting or local government studies or international relations. If you do some benchmarking, that's okay, compare. To what extent do they have very strong affiliations with those granting agencies? And you see the difference, and you see why those universities for, over, for the past 20 years have consistently been on top of the game in terms of the ranking continentally. So this is part of the background, meaning that part of the take home message for this is to populate our CVs or try academic fellowships, research fellowships, and grants. Then the CV becomes more complete. So this is, uh, again, This is the main assignment for which I was told to speak on. I tried to harvest one dozen plus tips, and we're going to rush through the tips very quickly. The first tip is what I term familiarization with the names of granting agencies. Deliberately, this slide was repeated. Again, the names are here. 
we see Fulbright. Incidentally, for the months of November and December every year, it's a special time for these granting agencies. Do you know what they do? They look at what you call new budgets for the new year. So a strategic agenda on the part of OAU is also look at how to have a process to target all these granting agencies for the new year, because the course will be out by January or the first quarter of 2023, meaning that the institutions who are at the receiving end should have an arrangement to leverage on the opportunities provided for these grants across all disciplines, including medieval history. So we see that as a tip and as an incentive, familiarity with those granting agents. And the reasons are very clear. What do I mean by familiarity? A knockout point like eligibility criteria could do a proposal, meaning a rejection, meaning that there was a failure to identify a single, a simple criteria like, am I eligible? Is OAU eligible? Is Nigeria eligible? Is my gender eligible? Something as simplistic as that would mean three months of work and all of that. So we see that as the first step, familiarization with those granting messages as a boost to competitiveness. We have a second one that says familiarization with the grant cycle. What is a grant cycle? A grant cycle is that process that starts from where the idea was originally conceptualized up to the submission of the proposal, up to the award, up to the implementation of the proposal, up to the project closeout, meaning all the obligations under that project were met. This is a common thing. And we have illustrations for grant cycles. This is a 10 phase grant cycle that starts from the initial conceptualization up to if the award was granted, up to the meaning that familiarization means that you are part of the game. You know the onions, you know all the terrains concerning grant and grant implementation. Well, we have another one here, which is a six phase, but which is an adapted form. So we see that as tip two. Incidentally, the Grant cycle is the heartbeat of this uh, grantsmanship culture. It is the heartbeat, the familiarization with it. And some of the notes are made there. We have tip number three. We have another form of grant cycles. Again, from the proposal concept up to, it becomes an iterative process, meaning in cycles from point of recruitment up to retirement. That is the mandate for academics. So you must run one cycle. You must run a cycle continuously. Again, familiarization with that is also a boost to grants too. We have instances where some labs, particularly for the sciences, they could run concurrently. They have a grant that is being tidied up. You have a current grant that is under implementation. You have another grant that is being targeted to start in 2023. These are again boosts for us. And the faculty of administration cannot be left out of this. So we have another tip, which is opportunity scanning. And this is so important. What is opportunity scanning? It says, what are all those avenues for funding, for scholarship in your field of specialization? What are all those avenues? Again, opportunity scanning is the first phase of the grant cycle, okay? And this is so important. Part of the notes too, what are all the current grants that are being run in the faculty of administration in each of the departments. For example, for all the aforementioned names, what are the current grants? Grants, what are the historical grants? What are the cross-cutting grants? What are grants for PG students? What are grants for early career researchers? What are grants for mid-career and grants for senior career? Grants for collaborative, grants for all others. Again, that is seen as a, a key contribution to this. We have, again, grants databases contain those portals globally. There are portals that house, house all the listing of grants and granting agencies. Those are databases, meaning that part of the take home for, for me and for you is familiarity with this. And number one there is grants.gov, is the biggest grants database, meaning all grants and granting agencies under the sun are housed under grants.gov. We have others like uh, uh, Terraviva, Grantcraft, 
profile etc again we really must access these granting agency granting portals or grant databases we have again the last one is for subscription now we have tip number six this is important why do proposals fail or why are proposals successful again we have the harvest of reasons this is of interest to and that should guide us to do very competitive proposals we have a long list and the first could be what you call disconnectedness among the sections of the proposal from the beginning to the end there is really no connection among all the arguments you have lack of originality no novelty no newness the executive summary is usually on the very first page and a number of reviewers may not read the bulky document meaning if the executive summary is so faulty then the proposal may be adversely affected all other reasons are stated we have a granting agency that ranked all the reasons including the topmost reason is where the overall concept is wrong then the proposal cannot fly and they will have all other reasons, again, about the design, about hypothesis, about the objectives, about the structure, about the logical flow, a whole long list of reasons why proposals fail. We have, again, tip number seven, how do you nurture your granting skill? The definition of grantsmanship reflected artistry. Artistry means you learn by doing. So how do you build up that skill, the skill set, the competence for grants and grantsmanship? Again, we have some general suggestions here about, for example, the very elephant in the room there is, again, consistent capacity building over time. That capacity building could be joining every, every workshop, every right shop that has to do with grantsmanship. And they have a long list, then personal habits, like voracious reading, what are the hot topics in our fields? What are the most recent arguments, paradigms, ETC in our fields? Again, we know that for reviewers, ultimately, what is the assessment in the grant review? What is the assessment? It's a test of knowledge. So we have tip number eight, nine, ten, uh, based on the researcher development framework. For those who are familiar with the researcher development framework, Again, we have uh, part of number eight is again knowledge and intellectual ability. What determines the success of a grant application? In brief, it is a test of knowledge. And in that case, you have all the dimensions to do with your knowledge and intellectual capacity, your knowledge base, your cognitive abilities, your creativity, all the details, analysis, synthesis ability to provide argumentative, very persuasive uh, points about the topic. Again, the details are there. We have uh, the next one, which is uh, tip number nine, personal effectiveness. This may be underrated, our habits. For example, habits like, you could have habits like general enthusiasm for knowledge, for reading, for writing for you know, responsibility, all of that preparation and prioritization, all the details are there, okay? Then we have number 10, research governance and organization. This is related to overall professionalism to act as a researcher. All the things to do with research ethics, research integrity, and all the compliance issues. We have argument number 11, which is, uh, again, this is part of a uh, community service, your visibility, ability to engage, ability to influence, ability to impact. Our senior head professor of Awale belongs to this group. He is coming with a whole, you know, lots of years of knowledge to share with us over time. Okay, finally, we have, uh, we have, again, in the uh, OAU homepage, part of the OAU web link, we have a link to 170 memoranda of understanding and agreements, which OAU has signed with previous uh, organizations and universities. We see this as a resource. Incidentally, if you check through, you may see some, mostly for science though, or you may see some for humanities and uh, social sciences. 
we see this as a resource, but that is barely, barely utilized. And finally, web bridge, leveraging on web tools and resources. Currently, you cannot practice grants and grantsmanship without web tools and resources. And all the details are on the web. But in particular, we have this that is domiciled in OAU website. It's called grantsmanship.oaueife.edu.ng. This was done as part of our collaboration with the Carnegie Group. That was done early this year. All the details about grants and grantsmanship, including review processes, including all the requirements for the practice of grantsmanship are here. Now, in towards rounding now, are there, is there an agenda for building, for building a, a competitive agenda for grantsmanship? For example, is there a process for addressing this? Can we have a six step process for building competitiveness smart target, synergy, inclusiveness around. This is for the faculty and for OAU. We could start with competitiveness. We could have, for example, how do we boost overall competitiveness? Knowing that without our affiliations with these granting agencies, our ranking cannot be better than it is. It cannot be. We can't build ranking based on IGR, on uh, distance learning with due respect. You can't. So the the, so we really need to build that aspect of grantsmanship, and these are just uh, suggestions. We have where there are grantsmanship think tanks, there are grantsmanship clusters, etc. The next is alertness. I mentioned that all those logos are doing their budgets for 2023, meaning that what would be the new cause, whether for Gates Foundation or for the European Union or for the Carnegie Group or for the DFID or for the Smithsonian, all this also cover the faculty of administration. We have a uh, smart targets. For example, how many cadastral can we have? How many EUs? How many of these? Then there is inclusiveness to meaning that we effectively mobilize each and everyone among us across gender, across uh, status. Then we have synergy, which is related to that, tapping on the knowledge and expertise of everybody to build competitiveness for grantsmanship. And that is related to Ubuntu, meaning that we all work together to build that capacity for grantsmanship. Now, okay. So we are rounding up now. We just want to look at this. We try to wrap up all these arguments. There is a focus on our ranking and visibility, and we look very carefully at the Times Higher Education on a score of zero to 100%, the elephant in the room for the scoring is tied to research. And that is about 60% of all the scores, whether for QS or for the THE, 60% of the score is based on research and citations per faculty, citations per scholar, citations per staff, per unit time. All those are tied to research. And research is tied to funding. And we can fund our research with our varsity cooperative loans. And that is why we really must look at all these global opportunities that are illustrated. So I want to thank you for your time, the Dean, then the Chief Host, the Vice Chancellor, and everybody. Thank you. I expect that we'll do that better, louder. Well, uh, the dean has uh, some bit of. Uh, well, Dr. Laiola, I've been asked to place you on standby. The dean has some information to pass across. So let's listen. I'd like to thank all of us, particularly our resource persons and uh, our distinguished guests, the keynote speaker, uh, our participants, particularly and uh, the rest of us we lump so many we lump so many things together and we apologize we didn't start early enough and that's one of the reasons for why we are where we are so i apologize on behalf of the faculty conferencing is an important segment 
of our roles as teachers and as students. Uh, that this has been, that we have been able to take this is an opportunity. And so we are not taking you for granted. We have not just come for ceremonies, just like uh, every of the speakers have, have said, we are going to assess how we are going to advance knowledge using conferencing. So we're not taking you for granted. We want to apologize. And that's why I'm addressing you. I uh, want to thank you for your patience. Um, one of the things that we will do now, we ought to have gone for tea break, but tea break. I mean, so we ought to have gone, uh, but it's very unfortunate that uh, we're not able to do that uh, up to this point. I want to crave your indulgence, please. That will take one more session of a word now and it's going to be brief uh we're not going to read long drawn citations any longer uh so that um other awardees will not feel slighted uh, we have not come to humiliate anybody uh we recognize each and every one of us please uh let's take it like that we'll have one more session of award and it's going to be very short then we'll take tea break so I, I still crave your indulgence to be more patient so that we'll take uh, Professor Ogubile's um, very important session on the on work on workshop. So I, I, it's an appeal. And I, I, I want to appeal very humbly that we'll keep on uh, being patient. Thank you very much. Ah, please, that should be better for my team. No? Let's put our hands together for him. He has actually made my job very um, lighter. Okay. Um, I would like us to celebrate uh, the more uh, Professor uh, Seiju Sini for his uh, presentation. It's so fantastic, very, very fantastic. Uh, he did a very good job of, of that. Um, I'd like to call uh, the representative of Mr. Adidi Gizakios, Dr. Mrs. Salau, to please uh, come up stage. I'll call on Dr. Olayiwola. Are you here as well? Please uh, come over to present uh, the citation. And Dr. Olayiwola, uh, may I request that you make this snappy? Uh, don't do like uh, uh, Mr. Dilabu who's one plus one is 11. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. Standing on the existing protocols, I'm here to read out the citation of Mr. Adedeji Zakios, FCA. Mr. Adedeji Zak is one of the youngest ever commissioner of finance with strong track record of reform in internally generated revenue, process improvements, and financial turnaround. He is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. He is also an alumnus of the prestigious Harvard Kennedy School, United States of America with a proven track record of over 15 years of hands-on executive experience. He's an expert generalist in overseeing all aspects of a multi-million dollar business and a proactive goal-oriented senior executive. In year 2005, Mr. Zakios graduated summa cum laude in accounting from Obafemi Awolo University, Leife, Nigeria. From January 2004 to May 2006, as the finance leader in Procter and Gamble Company, he was selected as the best in class by the senior management team and appointed 
as the internal controller, single point of contact. Due to his outstanding performance in corporate finance, he also served as the general accounting and stewardship manager from October 2007 to May 2011 for the Porter and Ganbro Company in Lagos, Nigeria. Mr. Zach's agility and ability made him an extraordinary manager that had modest success and he became the commissioner for finance of the Ohio State government from 2011 to May 2015, one of the youngest ever in the history of Nigeria. From June 2011 to May 2016 as the commissioner, he led a team of 50 people up to institute to institute a robust framework for financial forecasting that identified new re revenue sources and expense drivers. He also improved the condition to assess capital markets by enactment of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. This led to sustainable growth in cash flow for recurrent expenditure and financing capital expenditure. Owing to his interest in finance in 2017, he became a fellow of the Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you, Mr. Zakios Adedeji, FCA. Thank you. I would like to call on the Dean, Professor Funshu Adeshola, uh, to step uh, up stage to present the award. He will be supported by Professor Aladifa Oli, uh, Professor Salau, and the HOD of Management and Accounting, Professor Grace Akinola. Your attention is in the idea, ma. Please come up stage, sir. On behalf of the Faculty of Administration, I will presenting to you the representative of uh, Chief Zakios Adedeji. This award of excellence presented this day, 29th day of November 2022, for the commitment to scholarship, institutional growth, and outstanding performance in industry. Thank you. Also standing on the existing protocols and recognizing the Vice Chancellor, uh, ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor and all the principal officers here seated, the deans of faculties and our professors. I would like on behalf of uh, Mr. Aride Gizakios to appreciate the university and particularly the faculty of administration uh, for this great honor uh, conferred on him. Uh, of course, he has this mind as at last week he was there and I'm hoping that tomorrow he will be back in Nigeria. Uh, today is currently in London. He would have loved to be here. 
um, and he's also still promising that beyond what he has been able to do so far, he will continue to make his contribution, not only to the department, as in his characteristic manner, he's making direct contribution to our nation, uh, directly, I mean, into the economy of Nigeria. And I also want to uh, please uh, inspire our students to follow the same uh, route because this man graduated with a first uh, class honors in this department. And uh, in all his endeavors, he remains you know, a first class uh, representative of the university. So please, our uh, students, please, this is so inspiring to have this honor today uh, for Mr. Azdede Jezakios. And you also be happy to hear that He's also an aspiring PhD uh, older. So very soon, uh, we are celebrating him again uh, in this capacity. Thank you so much once again, Awa. Thank you for uh, being with us so far. I would like to call on the representative of Mr. Adide Jiku Saditayo, uh, Mr. Temitayo. Adi Deji Adi Doi to come off stage um, to receive his award. I also like to call on Dr. Ibokwe, Madam, um, to come off stage to present um, his citation. You have one minute, ma. You have 45 seconds, ma. You can do it then. Now really standing on existing protocols, I still greet our awesome students. The um, citation is for Mr. Adedeji Chris Adetayo. Chris obtained his first degree in international relations from the Obafemi Awolowo University, Leife, in 1998. He finished top of his class and received two awards at the university convocation. He has also completed the master degree MSc in the same school. Alongside this, he holds a master in business administration degree from University of Lagos. I'll just go straight to his professional career. Between 1999 and 2004, Chris was manager British Council. Between 2005 and 2008, he was manager, PR and sponsorship, V-Mobile, now Airtel. Between 2008 and 2012, he was head, experiential and partnership marketing, Etisalat, now Nine Mobile. 2012 to 2016, he was executive director, proximity communication. Between 2017 to date, he is now Chief Operating Officer, CNG Group. In conjunction with other partners, Chris set up the CNG Group with core focus in communication and marketing. The group provides services for a range of multinational companies, including Coca-Cola, Nigeria, Guinness, Nigeria, Rectus Bicancer, Dangote Industry, Pradis Global, and Intel. His professional membership, Chris is a fellow and member of various professional associations. These are fellow National Institute of Marketing of Nigeria, member Nigeria Institute of Public Relations, member Nigeria Institute of Management, member Nigeria Institute of International Affairs, member Institute of Strategic Management of Nigeria. Service, national service. Chris has served the nation in various capacities. Member Marketing Committee of the Nigerian Olympics Committee, NOC. Marketing Consultant, Nigeria Volleyball Association. Marketing Consultant, National Sports Festival, Lagos. Chris is the first and incumbent president of the International Relations Alumni Association, IRAA. The association was formed in 2018 and includes all graduates of the International Relations Department of OAU. In this role, he has led 
IRAA to donate more than 3,000 volume of books, journals and magazines, as well as multiple desktop computers to the department's library. In addition, he has led IRAA to organize and deliver annual seminars to students as well as other assistants to the department. Chris is also one of the conveners of the Great Ife Alliance, the alumni group of OAU students of the 1990s. The group, with his active leadership, commenced and has renovated two of the blocks of residence in Mozambique Hall of OAU. Of course, he's into writing, so he's a columnist and opinion writer in the nation, premium times, and cable newspapers. Chris is fluent in three languages, English, Yoruba, and Hausa, and he enjoys sports, sports like football, basketball, and long tennis. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you, Chris. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, madam. I would like to call on the Dean, Professor Funsho Adeshola, uh, to step forward. Uh, Professor Alati Faole, once again, uh, uh, Professor Salau, HOD Management and Accounting, Professor Akinola, your attention is needed here. Uh, you are going to support the Dean in presenting uh, this award. Professor Mike, I dare you. Please join. Please come upstairs and join them. Please pardon, pardon the oversight. I, 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 I am made to understand. Please, a round of applause for him. He is the only professor from the Department of Local Government Studies and Development Studies that is here and present. Please join them, sir. of the Faculty of Administration OAU Ilefe, this award of excellence is presented to you, Mr. Adedeji Chris Adetayo, for your outstanding performance in networking, geared towards scholarly and institutional development. Dated this 29th day of November 2022. Congratulations. Hold, just before you take the photograph, um, I think I've made another error and you are going to pardon me. Professor Benson, please come off stage as well. The error is mine, please. Until he gets here, we won't stop clapping. Thank you, thank you. Standing on existing protocols, on behalf of Mr. Chris Adedigi Aditayo, I would like to appreciate the Vice Chancellor, ably represented by the Deputy VC Academic, the Principal Officers of the University, other management staffs of Faculty of Administration, the LOC, the Organizing Committee, the students in general, and everyone here present. Mr. Chris said, and I quote, said he dedicated this to Almighty God and he see it as a charge to do more for humanity in general. Thank you very much.
right about now we'll be going to into the second uh, presentation workshop uh, presentation please please is it's not going to take time okay no oh sir sir who are you representing Sorry, we, we've been trying to see who is representing him. Oh. No, 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 don't worry. Don't worry, you take it. No, no, you, you, you take it. You take it now. You take it. Uh, I'd like to invite um, Dr. The representative the representative of uh, Mr. Ogundikwe Tolu Lokwe. You are the one representing, and you never said so since. Anyway, all right. Um, Dr. Bello is here to present the citation. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here this afternoon to read the citation of Mr. Ogundipe Tululope Anthony. Mr. Ogundipe is a seasoned banker with over 15 years' experience in the financial services sector, with experiences in various areas of banking including customer services, business development, operation strategy, international operations, corporate banking, training and branch operations, coordination, and treasury operations. He's a team player and a leader with excellence communication, interpersonal financial management, skills and is also a customer focused and process driven business enabler and has experience in executing strategies in banking industry he has traveled to the 36 states of the federation including all major cities and state capitals in Nigeria. He has a good understanding of how an organization and its employees can achieve superior and surface cultured entity. Mr. Ogudipe is currently a group at banking services at Premium Trust Bank Limited since March 2022 to date. It's also a group head, it was a group head branch coordination, technology and service delivery channels of Polaris Bank Limited, formerly Sky Bank, between September 2020 to 2022. Also a deputy group head branch coordination, technology and service delivery of Polaris Bank Limited, 2016 to August 2020. Also a chief operating officer at Main Street Bank, PLC, on secondment between August 2014 to July 2016. Was also the head experienced Center coordination at Heritage Banking Company Limited between January 2013 to January to July 2014. It was also operating strategy, foreign subsidiaries and operation manpower planner between October 2009 to January 2013 at Sky Bank Lagos in Nigeria. Also, Chief Operating Officer at Sky Bank Guinea Limited, Guinea Conakry, between October 2008 
to September 2009. There was also branch coordination and customer service group head office between January 2006 to August 2007, also at Skybank. At Prudent Bank PLC, it was customer service manager between 2005 to May 2005 to December 2005. His educational background, he had BSc in accounting and management in 2001 at OAU IFE. And also, he has MSc in finance and accounting at the University of Aberdeen, in the United Kingdom, he is happily married with children. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here this afternoon to present to us Mr. Ogundipe Tululapoe Antoni. Thank you. May I have the attention of the dean here? Okay, Professor Adishola, uh, Professor Faoli. Professor Faoli, sir. Please. Uh, Professor Akinola. Professor Salau. Professor Benson. Is Professor Adiyeye still in the hall? Okay. I want to thank our students and our participants for being patient this long. Uh, we'll soon get over this in the GV. I want to apologize to the representative of um, Chi Otumba, to Lulope Ogundipe. Uh, this is the person when you saw the slide that I was presenting uh, in my welcome address. This is the person that mobilized. I mean, these are powerful people, bankers and uh, administrators who came to refurbish that classroom that i showed you who came who came under his uh, yes under his leadership under his presidency the twenty thousand and one set of accounting students who came to flood lead the faculty that we are enjoying now so i mean I, I, we don't mean to embarrass anybody or humiliate anybody we are very sorry uh i acknowledge that you people came and we acknowledge you while you came we thought you just came to show friendship. We didn't know that you came to represent or to ba to lulope or gundipe. So we apologize once more. Um, Dr. Benson, you are going to hang the gallant on the representative of um or tumba to lulope or gundipe. We were in touch up to yesterday. I didn't know he was not going to come. Uh, suddenly he surprised me with this, and so we are very sorry. Uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Administration, thank you. We we'll present this award of excellence to Otumba, to Lulope, or oh, Gudipe. What for? For his agency in mobilization and commitment to scholarly and institutional development. Dated this 29th day of November 2022. Thank you. Congratulations. Like others, I stand on the existing protocols. I recognize all my lecturers here, starting from the FC down to the least person. So on behalf of Otumba Tulopi Ogundipe, the president of OAU 2001 accounting set, uh, your appreciation is present to everybody, especially to the management of the university for these recognitions given to him and his family. He sent me just one or two messages to be delivered on his behalf. And that is, one, the concept of others. That we exist for others. That we must understand that the existence 
or the life given to you is for others to enjoy. You cannot, I repeat, you cannot spend more than 10% of your earnings, whether you're in business or you're earning salaries. If you get home today, go and do the analysis. You cannot spend more than 10%. Essentially, the remaining 90% is either wasted or somebody take it away unknowingly. Why not giving it to others? He also sent me to great effect students. Great effect. Articulate effect. If I conscious effect. Great. That was priest. He sent me to you that let us keep the temple and the flag flying. The glory of Abafemi Arun University, we can need to, you know, dominate the entire universities in the world. Whenever they send to me from the head office to interview students, once I see it in your certificate that you graduated from IFE, you have scored like 90%. <laughs> so, I facilitated uh, direct employment from part two about four to five years ago. Majority of them are with me today. We call it bright and the best. We brought it to the school because the management of our guarantee trust from where I work believe in the quality of students being graduated uh, by the I mean by the school, you know. And I want us to keep the temple flying. It's a simple. The, what we are attending today is part of those things that keep you ahead of others. So please let us keep that certificate jealously. And I want to encourage all of you that when you graduate from school, don't forget to come back. From beginning of your studentship here to the end, it will be full of, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But when you are leaving the gates, always take away with you the good. Forget about the bad and the ugly. On behalf of 2001 Accounting Set and Automato Lokwe Gundipe, I thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jalili Olale, thank you so very much for, for that. I'd like to call on the representative of Mr. Abiola Falaya Joe. Please come off stage. Please let's put our hands together for him. And I will invite Dr. Wale Olushola to come to the podium to present his salutation. I want to crave your indulgence to stand on existing protocol. I salute your courage thus far. I read the citation of Chief Abiola Falayo Joe Jr. Abiola Falayo Joe Jr. Born 30th December 1976, is a Nigeria-born psychiatric clinician, community development advocate, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and a former student union leader at the Bafemi Awolo University. Chief Abiola holds postgraduate qualifications in the fields of international relations and bachelor and postgraduate degrees in nursing science, University of Australia, Adelaide, and La Trobe University of Melbourne, also in Australia, with over 16 years of practice in psychiatry. While a student of OAU, he was fully involved in student activism and held important positions in the various student bodies. He was a member of students' parliaments. He was also a member of different committees under the SUG. He was also a former president of the International Relations Student Association. And uh, it's, it's a privilege that another president, the current president, is standing in for him today. Uh, please, yes. He began his professional career as a lecturer in the Department of International Relations and uh, moved on to Europe and Australia, where he now practices in the challenging field of mental health. In the field of philanthropy, that Abiola truly stands out. With support from friends and different parts of the world, he built a community health center in Ikwetu, Ijesha, which is now fully operational 
and serve the community and several villages in close proximity. His alma mater, OAU, has also benefited from his benevolence as he was instrumental in the renovation of Mozambique Hall in 2022. Apart from this, he has granted countless scholarships to brilliant students of Oriya Days, Obokun, or Shun State, and donates generously to the annual Iwu Day and Ipetu Jesha Day celebrations. It is for his long-standing contributions to Ipetu Jesha community that the paramount ruler of Ipetu Jesha Kingdom bestowed on him the, the extinct title of Bobadamor of Ipetu Jesha Kingdom. In this role, AFJ, as is also fondly called, assumes the honorific role of the chief advisor to the king, a role in which is evidently well suited. Well, there are many achievements in this uh, resume that I cannot because of time. But I think what I can deduce from reading through it all is that he personifies and uh, epitomizes that statement of faith that we all can achieve our dreams if we have the courage to pursue them. With this, I present to you Chief Abiola Falayojo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the Dean, Professor Funsha Adishola, I come up stage. Professor Michael. Adeyeye. <laughs> Professor Michael Adeyeye, I will need your attention here. Professor Faoli. Professor Benson. exhaust your patience we really appreciate you we really appreciate your endurance oh, oh, wait. This, is, this is the last we're very sorry uh the faculty of administration obafemi awolowo is presenting to you on behalf of we used to call him dr fash this award of excellence presented to is now doctor is no longer doctor is chief Abiola Falayajo for his illustrious bridge building mien aimed at scholarship and community service dated this 29th day of November 2022. Congratulations. existing protocol. Um, I send the regards of Chief Abiola Falayajo Jr. to the administration of the Faculty of Administration. To everyone here present, thank you for this distinguished award. And like the Dean said, we call him Dr. Fass, and he's someone that is very open to giving back to his alma mater. And I met him several times and very open to giving back to the department. So one thing that Dr. Fass sends to everyone is that never forget where you're from. Always remember the people that trained you. And never forget people. People are networks and bridges that you can never get elsewhere. So as much as possible, every opportunity you find to interact with people, make good use of it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. By the way, I will be calling on Professor David Ogunbile uh, to come to the podium to present the workshop paper on conducting effective literature review in social sciences 
A round of applause for Professor Ogunbile. to know everyone. Uh, let me thank uh, the Faculty of Administration, headed by the Dean. I also want to thank the Local Organizing Committee of this conference for counting me worthy to share my thoughts you know, with, uh, with you. Uh, let me first say that uh, this is called a workshop. Even though I have uh, 30 minutes, but I'm not going to because of the time already spent, I will make sure that I don't spend more than 20 minutes. Uh, so this is a workshop. Let me imagine I go to a mechanic workshop. And uh, at the workshop, we are intended you know, to display certain skills. We are intended to learn certain skills. We are intended to acquire certain things. And so in this moment of, uh, you know, workshop, which we are holding this afternoon, and the workshop is on what I call, you know, doing effective literature review in social sciences doing effective you know, literature review in social sciences. I may be in our workshop today, what I'm going to tell us is that because we cannot work without having a concept in our mind, I want to give you three assignments. The OK. The first assignment in our workshop today is that you can have maybe a small sheet of paper, formulate a topic proposal. Number two, in the formulation of the topic proposal, which I want you to do now, write it down, write the topic down. Maybe it's something that you've been, you already have before, or you are just conceptualizing. And then identify the variables of the topic, either you know the dependent or independent variables. And number three, describe the literature that you know you want to review, you want to have as you know your literature review. Now, in the formulation of that topic proposal, either you know it is for a journal article, if you're an academic, or if you're a student, PhD student, master's uh, student with research, or even undergraduate, BSc. So you have literature to, you know, to review. And then, what are the variables, you know, in the topic? Identify the independent variable in the topic and identify the dependent variables. Time will not permit us you know, to go into the details of this. What is literature review? I know most of us are familiar with this. And the, the, I don't know why you know, the LOC has decided you know, to make this an issue in your conference. But I know that this is very, very important. Number one, I have noted, you know, in my close to 30 years of, you know, teaching in the university and, uh, you know, writing thesis and then supervising thesis and serving as external examiner to some universities. There have been occasions when I went to those universities, reading through the literature review, I had to reorganize everything. I had to re practically reorganize everything. Even in the 
first generation universities. And by the time we try to look at all of this, the supervisors themselves and the students, they will be convinced that yes, actually, external examiner, what you have done is the right thing to do. Okay. Um, I've been asked to announce that we'll have the tea break now. It's just remain seated. They are going to serve on your, on your seats. That's just exactly what I want to say. Thank you. So, and so we have to practically reorganize, you know, the literature review. And one, because the variables in the topic were not well addressed. And uh, of course, as a former acting provost of our PG college here, we have also discovered these problems. And so I guess this is the reason why this becomes so important to us. What is literature review? In some other, you know, the other terminologies that we use, either you call it a review of related literature or review of a relevant uh, literature. Uh, two things that are there, you know, you talk of literature and you talk of review. Literature in terms of the material that you really want to use as a background, you know, for the work that you want to do, for the research that you want to do. And then review in terms of, okay, how do I appraise, you know, the works that have been done, you know, in the past that are really, really related to the topic that I'm dealing with. Sorry, I don't have more time. Uh, okay, relevant uh, review of relevant literature or review of related literature. Okay. It says in this short uh, presentation, the following will be identified. One, what are the common forms or types of literature for review? We have different types of uh, literature review in the humanities and the, the arts. Of course, we also have in the social sciences, we also have in the sciences, but we are just going to concern ourselves with the ones that you know are relevant to us. Now we have this type. Generally, when you talk of or you are doing literature review, in those days when we started, you know, as a young academic before the knowledge grew, we will go through what we call just a, you know, a, author review. You just take different authors and then you begin to begin to summarize and appraise different authors. But by the time we discovered that uh, you know knowledge was growing and then we were sharing ideas, then we discovered that thematic review becomes very important. That is the themes you know of the of the topic of the research that you are engaging in. And then you take literature review. Why is it important? How is it done? Yes, literature review is important because it has connections, very strong connections with several other aspects of research. And what are these aspects? The research topic and topic variables. You may not be able to write or to, to, to do justice to a topic without proper literature review, without appropriate, adequate literature review. And of course, it also has, you know, relationship to the research uh, objectives. And of course, the research scope, research, uh, you know, the statement of problem, and then significance of study, and the research met method and the theoretical framework. Now, what is the scope of literature review? What are the basic questions? One, what does literature review cover? Two, what lit literature does one review? Because you can have many, many kinds of uh, literatures. Interestingly, sometimes when I read through some works, either as external examiner, and then I say, look, how do you want to review? You collect all of these things. How do you want to assess this as literature? These are not literature. These are just, you know, 
these are these are not relevant at all. In fact, you don't even call all of this literature some way. Students or even members or academic persons always fall into this error. Now, what steps does one follow in reviewing, you know, particular literature? And then how does one categorize them? And then what is the justification for reviewing what you are reviewing? We continue what is covered. The coverage of the literature review depends largely on the type and nature of research. Secondly, that is the comprehensiveness, extensiveness, and volume of the literature review are determined largely on, by the intended objectives. Of course, the relevance, up to date, and currency of the literature you are reviewing will be very, very important. I remember when I was doing my PhD defense, and then one of the one of my examiners raised an issue. He said, this literature that you, are, you, that you have reviewed, they are too much, they are too extensive. And then the external examiner had to say, look, yes, too extensive. Is this an offense for literature to be too, too extensive? Are they not relevant? Are they not current? In fact, that's the end of the story. All of them agreed that the literature that I reviewed they were very accurate and they're up to date and they are relevant. Now, how do you select the literatures to be reviewed? Number one, from the topic, I have talked about the variables. You choose, you look at these different variables. How do you relate, you know, with the variables, you know, in the topic? Now, the statement of the problem. Okay, let me just leave this because I already talked about that before. What are the purposes of literature review? So I have quite a number of them here. Bringing the reader up to date on the knowledge of the field. So literature review is to bring you to the knowledge, you know, of what the, 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 the scholarship is. Number two is bringing awareness of the established knowledge. There is already an established knowledge. Actually, what you call research, it is you are searching for something. Sometimes what you are searching for has already been searched, but you are now researching. That's a, you know, among the Yoruba, or maybe some biblical thing, they say, Koson Titson Labi we are researching, you know, we are researching. So establish knowledge. And then we are testing the strengths and weaknesses of the established, well-established knowledge. If somebody has written a particular thing and then you take the, the, the literature, you want to review it, okay, what is this thing, the material that this person has written, how strong is it for your work? How does it serve the purpose for your work? What are the strengths and what are the weaknesses? You want to identify those things to be able to situate your own work properly. And of course, it talks about the provision of background for current research and then provision of handy guide. If you present a literature review, people should be able to read your literature review and be able to connect previous knowledge and current knowledge and of course, to be able to know that, yes, your work has the, a basis, you know, for going through research. And of course, we talked about, uh, you know, the depth and the breadth of literature review. It should justify the credibility and sense of a research that you are proposing. And of course, the identification of useful materials so you should be able to identify useful materials in that, uh, you know, of the work that you are doing. And of course, literature review also a first critical appraiser of the topic of research. Note this, what literature review is not. 
it is not annotated bibliography. Some people just compile certain things and then they review. There, you know, you don't just, you, 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 you are not able to build a bridge, you know, of the literature review of the materials that you, you, you know, you collect with what somebody is doing. So it is not listing of resources of information or the sources of information. It is not listing of that. Now, doing or conducting an effective literature review. One is that you read widely on topic variables. You can go back and then look at the topic that I, you know, I just told you that to formulate a topic or you choose a topic from what you have done before. What are the variables on that topic? Now, how do you then look for the work that relates to certain variables, independent variables and dependent variables? And then reading selectively on your topic area. So you have to read, select, not just everything. It is possible for you to read quite a lot. But now the second level is that selectively you read the ones that focus on the different variables. For instance, if you have a topic, you may be able to discover one independent variable and two dependent variables or three dependent variables. And by the time you focus on each of those, you are able to decipher what materials that you want to read for your review. And then you identify themes and connecting issues. You know, to build, you know, a knowledge pyramid in a thesis. You know, as a bricklayer myself, I know the importance of uh, the foundation, you know, the, you know, the walls, the windows, up to the lintel level and to the roof. So that is what you are building by the time you present a literature review. You continue. You determine variables in the topic. I've mentioned that. Identify the depth and breadth of the topic. So that is your literature review will be able to explain to us the depth and the width of, you know, of uh, your research. Identify the voices and trends in the body of the selected you know, literatures. What we mean by voices are the author's materials, author's voices. What are they saying? How are they saying what they are saying? How are they analyzing what they are analyzing? Or what, have, what they have done? How will you assess their voices? Are they objective in the assessment? In the appraiser, are they able to actually distinguish between ordinary work or research work? So that is very important. What are the concepts? Identifiable in the topic. What are the theoretical contents of the selected uh, literature? And what are the empirical cases in the body? Ultimately, this is where we are coming to. That is, the aspects of literature review will have three important components. You have the concept, you have the theory, and then we have the empirical you know, cases. And so when you take the concept, depending on your area, for instance, if you are in psychology, you are in sociology, you are in uh, management and accounting, the way we use concepts across discipline may be different. And so you they have to understand if you are reading somebody in a particular area, the voices of those people, how they use concepts, will be meaningful to you if you really understand your area of specialization. And then, of course, the theoretical content, very, very important. We have different disciplines with uh, different, uh, you know, theories. And then, of course, the empirical cases. For instance, if somebody has written something on Ghana, I want to write something, you know, from 
you know the context of Nigeria, and uh, you are bringing, you say, okay, this and this and this person have written in Ghana, have written in Sierra Leone, have written in Cameroon. You are writing something in Nigeria. There are areas of connections and there are areas of disconnections. So you will be able, you know, to, to master the context of your own, you know, of your own research. How do you source for appropriate uh, literatures for review? Well, to me, I believe journal articles, edited books, authored books. I've seen some individuals, at least from my experience, you read the literature review and you see students writing uh, from the interview condu I conducted you know, with uh, this particular KBAC, the interview said, look, what is the literature that this person, is it the interview that somebody has conducted that is now called a literature review? What literature is the person, you know, the person has missed it. Or somebody says, yes, you just see, see some, you know, some uh, magazine or newspaper, you know, articles, and then you bring all of those under review. How do you make sense of that? Now, writing a good review, the language of the review, reporting in review, and then determining a workable literature review, and then like a building a house. Sorry, because I promised you that I don't want to take your time and I don't want to, you know, spend too much time. So you say what? So, um, so that's why I won't be able to explain all of these uh, items so that I don't go against uh, your wish. And then forms of a literature review. Yes, are you writing this literature review focusing on dissertation or thesis or journal articles or book chapters or a proposal that you are, pro you know, producing for somebody? Now, how are you presenting literature review, the elements? You have introduction or background information, body of the review containing the discussion of the sources. Then you have summary and synthesis of the central arguments. And then reviewers voice. How do you appraise the voices of the work you are reviewing? And then what are the gaps? that you have seen in somebody's work that you want to feel. And also here, some people make some mistakes. This person has told you the scope of his own research, how he wants to do it. And then you take your own review. I say, this person didn't do this. This person did it. What's, what's your problem about what somebody didn't do? He has done what he intended, what he has spelled out to do. So your own, is to say, this is the gap I want to fill. Don't condemn and don't nail the, 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 your work of review to the cross. And then, how to provide for yourself writing notes. Yes, what are the things that you have to do? And this is another issue. When you, when you are reading, you are reading for something to review. And this is also very important. Because some people are falling into the error of plagiarism. When you read, you try to either summarize, and when you summarize in your own words, but make sure that what you are summarizing, you properly reference. This is very, very important so that you are not going to be charged for plagiarism. And then you make notes on all the readings that you have done. Noting the themes and issues, new vocabularies, new terms, and new terminologies. And then use of a literature review. I may not be able to go through all of this. Uh, you know, literature review justifies, you know, the reason for embarking on a particular work. It justifies the, topic, the choice of the topic you are researching on. It helps you to formulate research questions. 
It helps you to develop research objectives and so on and so on then, uh, and how it sharpens a critical review of the research, at least for yourself. And the thematic uh, literature review versus author have talked about this. And the uh, you know, background and preparatory reading. These are also very important. How you have to do proper reading, you know, of the materials that you are engaging in. Now let's recap. You have to do a checklist for analyzing the literature and uh, for helping, sorry, to determine your own research approach, which has been suggested by Collins. You know, this an author who is suggesting this. And then what was the purpose of the previous study? This are just a recap of uh, what I have been talking about. And then I've talked about this, the conceptual, the theoretical, and the empirical. So we come back to our workshop again. From the topic that you have done, because we, we don't have the time now, otherwise what I intended was if I had the time, my time, I would just say that we should share, you know, our writing so that we then begin to say something and then we begin to interact. But there's no time for us now. And I want to say, Thank you. Thank you. Please let's put our hands together at the board for Professor Kukuli. I, I think we should be observing the parallel breakout sessions now. Uh, am I right? Well, uh, okay. Um, I think it's appropriate to uh, put a hold on the open formalities of uh, this conference at this point so that we can have the parallel uh, session. And afterwards, um, I think there'll be a lunch break before we reconvene for the closing um, ceremony. First, Mark, I wish you a wonderful academic engagement in the parallel session. It, 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 um, it concluded here now. So where, where are the sessions holding? Dr. Chidi, where are the parallel sessions holding here or elsewhere? Where are the parallel sessions holding here or where? All right, will you, will you, where, what, they know where this, where these places are. Okay, all right. I think we are done here. And thank you so much for your time, for your patience. Uh, we'll see you immediately after the sessions for the closing ceremonies. Thank you.
Don't go so far, cause anything I get now for me and you. More music on trendybeats.com.
I forgot how to give those who are in need. So selfish of me. Even when it got too hard, too hard for me to care, I forgot how to try. My baby says she hungry. I give him food. I tell him I will do anything for you. But a stranger say, please, I no get you. I look him like this, say, who are you? 'Cause I forgot how to love the way you asked me to. Remind me, remind me how to love. La, 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 la.
Good evening, everybody. You're all welcome to this session, the Biz Admin session. And I think our online presenters are ready. We will be starting with um, Mr. Sonny Abdurrahman Bala, Nasir Kauje, and Bakari Taufi Kolanriwaju. Please, are you available for presentation?
Hello? Your topic is on SUKUK as a viable instrument of financing infrastructural development in Nigeria. Can you be, please signify if you are available for your presentation? Then we will go on to the next presenter then. Please let us know when you make yourself available. The next presenter is Mr. Lawal Ahmed, Olasunkomi. Mr. Lawal Ahmed, Olasunkomi should be presenting something on recruitment procedures and workers' productivity in the Nigeria Public Service. Mr. Lawal. Well, let's go through the list of presenters to know who, those who are on ground. Mr. Simeon Anifo Oshe. Simeon Anifo Oshe. Organizational behavior constructs and employees are effective commitment in legal states public service. Please, are you available? Mr. Senior Anifoshi, I can see your name displayed there. Yeah. I'm around. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Can you please make your presentation in seven minutes? Okay. My name is uh, my name is Sani Foshi Nodawale. I'm presenting a paper on organizational behavior construct and employer affective commitment in legal state public service. These 798 senior employees represented the study population, while 400 samples were drawn. Three, three, four copies of questionnaire were returned back and representing 83.5%. The study found that compensation, procedural justice, and just security had Hello, positive Wale. and significant effect on employee affairs commitment in Lagos State Public Service. Introduction. Hello, Mr. Behavior. Yes. Yes, please. You are supposed to have sent your material to us or display it. Please share it. Share it okay. on the screen so that we can follow. Please allow me to share. Yes. Allow me to share from the center. Go ahead, please. I cannot share. You have to allow me to share from your side. You have been allowed. Please okay. just yeah. You have not allowed me to share, please. Mm -hmm. Have you clicked on share screen? Yes. So what are you getting? You are not allowed. I'm not allowed. You cannot start screen sharing while the other person is sharing. Maybe somebody is also sharing. Okay, so one minute, please. Try now, sir. Please try again. Okay, okay. Yes, you can see. Can you see it now? Yes. Thank you. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. okay. My name is Annie Fortes Nolawale. I'm presenting a paper on organizational behavior constructs and employer affairs commitment in Lagos State Public Service. After that, 3,708 senior employees of Lagos State Public Service represented the sample uh, population study, while 400 
employees were done a sample, and then four other copies of questionnaire were submitted, were distributed, 334 were returned back, and representing 83.5%. The study found that compensation, procedural justice, and job security had positive and significant effect on employees' effective commitment in the Lagos State Public Service. Introduction, organizational behavior is a social science discipline that studies human behavior. In order to be able to use the result of that study to focus on how employees could be compensated properly and also how organization can prepare job security for their employees. Certain to the problem. Bad me in 2016, five going with 2019, and actual book called 1998, identify injustices that cause employees not to be committed to organization. This study will provide solution to the employee of uh, to this problem of inappropriate compensation of employee, absence of personal justice and job security in Lagos in public service. So the questions. The questions that the study will provide answer to in this study are, one, what is the effect of compensation on employee affected commitment in Lagos in public service? Two, how is procedural justice affect employee affected commitment as they carry out their job in Lagos in public service? Three, to what extent does job security affect employee affected commitment as they carry out their job in Lagos in public service? Study objectives. The objective of the study are one, to analyze the effect of compensation on employee affected commitment in Lagos in public service. Two, to determine the effect of procedural justice on employee affected commitment in Lagos in public service. Three, to examine the effect of job security on employees affected commitment in Lagos in public service. So the hypothesis. Hypothesis one, compensation has no significant effect on employee affected commitment in Lagos in public service. Hypothesis two, HO2. Procedural justice has no significant effect on employee affected committee and legal public service. HOTD, job security has no significant effect on employee affected committee and legal public service. And then HO4, combined organizational behavior constructs do not have significant effect on employees affected committee and legal public service. Literature review. Literature was reviewed on the following variable of the study. Employee affected committee EAC represented the, uh, the dependent variable why compensation CP, procedural justice PJ, and joint security JS represented the independent variable of the study. Theoretical review. The underpinning theory for the study is AC 1991 theory of plant behavior, which explain, explain organizational behavior variables such as attitude, behavior, subjective norm, behavioral control, and intention to determine individual actual behavior. The relevance of asking 1991 to the study is that it will make employees to identify the relationship between attitude toward the behavior and actual behavior when attempts to be effectively committed to the organizations. Methodology. 400 questionnaires were distributed, 334 were returned back, and then the, 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 this represents 83.5. Chromeback alpha test values of instrument were reliable at Alpha 0.87 for EAC, Alpha 0.85 for CP, Alpha 0.74 for PJ, and Alpha 090 for GS. Data were analyzed using correlation and regression statistics with aid of SPSS version 5.0 software. Result of tests of hypothesis 1, 2, 3, and 4. Hypothesis 1, 2, 3, and 4 were tested with regression statistics. The result indicated that compensation, procedural justice, and job security had both individual and combine significant positive effect on employee affect committee in legal state public service. Findings. The finding on the objective of the study, which are analyzed, determine, examine, and measure the effect of compensation, procedural justice, and job security on employee affect commitment as they carry out their joint legal state public service, based on the result of the regression analysis, it reveals that compensation, procedural justice, and joint security had both individual and combined significant positive effect on employee affected committed as they carry out their job in Lagos in public service. Conclusion, based on the finding of the study, it is concluded that the independent variables, compensation, procedural justice, and job security in the regression model predicted employee affected commitment positively and significant, significantly. Therefore, the regression model is appropriate for policy implementation in Lagos in public service.
recommendation. They solely recommend that the Lagos State Public Service should solidify I their competition so. practices by making employees hire to be limited to the performance so that compensation will continue to yeah, exact yeah. potent effect on the employee affect community in the salary. Yeah. Two, the Lagos State Public Service should improve on their joint security ability in order to be able to provide stable employment for the employee in the service until they attain retirement age. End of presentation. I thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you for keeping to time. Well, I noticed some things in while you were presenting. You are you are actually supposed to present um, uh, your PowerPoint in slides, not word point. So please take note of that. And I never expected that you come here to come and read out. I mean, all the introduction as it were, abstract as it were. And uh, please in your presentation, you just start. Let us know why this study. That is what I, why this study, why are you carrying out the study? And uh, I mean, what you have, um, the ob meaning the objectives and uh, what you have achieved so far. I noticed that in your findings, you just lumped up everything, everything lumped together. The findings of each objective were not categorically stated. Please note that and uh, okay. effect the correction appropriately. Okay. Please. Okay. Any other, any other uh, um, uh, participant that will want to ask him any question? Any participant that would uh, want to ask, ask him any question? Please take note of the corrections. Okay. And effect all the corrections. Everything will be noted. Okay. Will be checked. Thank you. When you are sending you. in your final copy, please. Okay. Please you. specify the findings explicitly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. Yeah, any of, um, uh, any of the past participants that I've called earlier, are they on ground now? Um, uh, Mr. Sonny Abdurrah Abdurrahman Bala, I wouldn't know. It's okay, he's not on ground. Mr. Lawal Ahmed Olasukami, not around. Abdul Fatah Olan Rewaju Nuridin, not also available. Fashino and Sharaibi, not around. Rome, Mr. Rome. Thank you. Mr. Rome, not available. Well, these are the presenters I have here that were supposed to make presentations today. They are not here, but I can see some name being displayed there. I wouldn't know whether these people want to make online presentation. Good afternoon, ma. I want to make online presentation, but I'm to present for accounting. Okay, you are supposed to present for accounting. Yeah. I wouldn't know the section to, to uh, join. Accounting. It's so Okay, well, I'm just informed that this is the only virtual um, session. So please, you can go ahead. What's your name, please? 
I'm Ajibola Oluwa from Elayo. Ajibola Oluwa from Elayo. Please yes, go sir. ahead in, in seven minutes. Yes, your time starts now. Hey, good afternoon, um, all professors here present, all doctors and my colleagues. I'm presenting this afternoon. I'm presenting this afternoon topic titled Working Capital Management and financial performance of listed consumer goods firm in Nigeria. By way of introduction, working capital actually means the essence of um, current success over current liability. It is the composition, it is the components such as the cash, the inventory, the um, short term investment meant for the day to day running of the business. So we are, I'm actually talking about how this is, how working capital of consumer firms are managed in such a way we now want to correlate their management with the financial performance of listed consumer firms in Nigeria. Now, um, working capital basically plays a vital role in the performance of or profitability of firms because Every firm needs to run from day to day. They need a short-term finances to run from day to day. So every firm, but what is, has been discovered is that a lot of firm poorly manage the working capital, which has resulted to the issue of many firms um, uh, uh, running out of credit, becoming illiquid, and eventually running out of business. There has been a lot of research in this regard, but it, a lot of this research has focused on the manufacturing sector, the beauty, um, and uh, those listed on the Nigeria Stock Exchange. Only few have concentrated on the um, consumer goods, consumer consumer goods uh, firm in Nigeria. So therefore, this study, uh, therefore, examine the uh, working capital management and financial performance of this consumer firm, specifically now using re uh, receivable turnover, inven inventory turnover, cash conversion cycle to proxy the working capital management and return on assets to proxy the financial performance of this consumer goods firm. Now, uh, firm size was also used as control variable. Now, the main objective of the research is to examine the effect of working capital management on the financial performance of this listed consumer firms in Nigeria from 2009 to 2018. But more specifically, the objective is to determine the impact of receivable turnover on the financial performance of this listed goods firm in Nigeria, and also to examine the impact of the inventory turnover on the financial performance of listed uh, consumer goods firm in Nigeria, and also to investigate the impact of the cash conversion cycle on the financial performance of the listed consumer firms, listed consumer goods firms in Nigeria. My research question and my hypothesis has been drawn from my objective. I also looked at the in the conceptual review talking about the consumer goods firm and profitability, the working capital, the um, um, net working capital, working capital ratio, working capital determinants, working capital management and financial performance. All these are discussed in detail in the research. The major theory the research is on, on is the agency theory. This theory postulates that the daily running of a business enterprise is carried out by the agents whom are seen as managers. So that is why the major that's the um, major theory. The work is on on. There had been research 
in this uh, in, in this uh, regard alloy 2012 researched between was investigated the relationship between working capital management and financial performance of listed firms although not in nigeria he used the roa and roe as measures of performance while using cash conversion cycle from uh, current assets to uh, total assets and current liability to total asset were used as working capital management um, variables. Now, the correlation regression analysis was used by him to, by the researcher to, uh, to, for analysis, while the findings revealed that a non-significant relationship exists between cash conversion cycle and performance measurements. Other researchers also true went well, studied it and also made their findings the research design adopted in this study is a correlation research design the population are the 20 consumer goods companies listed on the floor of the nigerian exchange as at 31st may 2020 the purposeful sampling were used to select eight consumer goods company listed on the nigerian exchange which covered 209 to 2018 the secondary source of information we have collected from the audited financial statements of the listed consumer goods firm and the independent variable said earlier are uh, the average receivable period, the inventory conversion period, cash conversion period, uh, and also uh, the return on assets was used to proceed the financial performance of the firms. Why the firm size? is the control variable my modest specification is um is written there we have uh, the, the modern specification displayed there then i have my distributed data but for space i couldn't display all the uh, uh, data we have the descriptive data also displayed there for so i go straight to the findings we found out that the, there's a positive relationship between the working capital management and financial performance of consumer goods firm in Nigeria. The, receive, the receivable turnover management has no significant impact on the financial performance of listed consumer goods firm in Nigeria, while the inventory turnover management has a significant effect on the financial performance of listed consumer goods firm in Nigeria. Also, the cash conversion cycle has no significant effect on the financial performance of listed consumer goods firm in Nigeria. Also, we find this, we found out that the correlation coefficient shows that there is a positive relationship between working capital management and the financial performance of consumer goods firm. It's also found that, that out of the three variables that make up the working capital management in this study, there is a positive relationship between the average collection period and the financial performance of consumer goods firm in Nigeria. Based on the findings of the research, the uh, researcher concludes that the receivables turnover management has no significant impact on the financial performance of listed consumer goods firm in Nigeria. However, inventory turnover management has significant effect and cash conversion cycle on the other hand also has no significant effect on the financial performance of these firms now we recommend that the management of consumer goods firm in nigeria need to ensure that their inventory turnover is adequately managed to achieve a sustainable increase in financial performance this can be achieved by reducing the days of inventory turnover now, it is discovered that the longer the days of inventory turnover, this will affect the cash flow. And it can also lead to obsolescence, uh, spoilage, and wastage, thus affecting the financial profitability of the firm. Therefore, a sound mechanism is key to the management of inventory of consumer goods firm in Nigeria. Also, a good debt policy is therefore uh, pertinent and also she will play a vital role in the financial performance of consumer goods firm in Nigeria. Lastly, adequate and constant training should be taken in cognizance to update and acquit management with the current trend in the business world 
as regards working capital management because the business world is dynamic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, can you go back to, them to your methodology? Let's see your methodology slide. Yeah. Why are you adopting the correlation research design? Can you please shed light on that? Are you yes. still there? Yes, ma'am, there. Yes, please. Well, this is uh, the design, um, the researcher feels is best. Um, Aren't you the researcher? Huh? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Why are you not using the longitudinal research design method? Longitudinal research yes. design. Okay, ma, we'll get more on that. Because you're considering several variables and uh, you're going to, your research covers a, a period of time. 2009 to 2018. Then I would want to ask, why are you stopping at 2018? This is 2022. And as at the time the research was carried out, um, it was up to, the, it depends on the, some of the consumer goods firm do not have their, um, do not have their financials displayed as as um, regular as it should be so it's those that have up to um 2018 those are the ones that uh, but 2020 2018 2019 should be available now even if um uh, 2020 is a period um um uh, we can say 2020 is really not a balanced year as it were but 2019 i still feel something you, you should have updated data okay, included yeah. okay yes so we actually, yeah okay ma. Okay. yes okay. aside from that i i saw i looked through your research and um, what is it called your um, literature review your what is it called um literature you need to update it the the most current i saw there was 2019 they are 2020 right now. They, are, I mean, you have 2020. You, all you need to do is just to sit down and update your what is it called your literature, as it were. Okay. Okay, ma. Please show us your results. Your regression results. I didn't put. I have it in the main work. I didn't put that in the slide. Aha! You didn't include it. In the slide, right. I yeah. In the main work. yeah, I mean, those are the things we want to see. Huh? Those are okay, the things uh, that that's uh, those are, I mean, that's the argument you need to present to us why this um, uh, study is germane, you know, and it's um, uh, unfortunate you don't have it here as it were. It's in the work, but it's not in the study. Exactly. We, we don't have access to the work. <laughs> we don't have I'm access to the work. I'm still going to send the work to Paul. You are making a presentation, Ajibola. Yes. I, need to, I can only speak to what is being displayed. Do you understand? So that okay. we can guide you appropriately. Okay. I saw something there. That's why I, I said you should show the result. Hold on. Hello, Ajiwala. Please, yes. can you go back to your research objectives? Hello. Good. Since you are writing um, a paper, and the paper is on um, working capital and the financial um, performance, 
I don't see a reason why you are having four objectives. You should try as much as possible to collapse all these four objectives into one because uh, your paper is all about working capital and financial uh, performance. Um, looking at all those um, objectives that you are talking about, like uh, receivable turnovers and uh, the other ones, they are just proxies of um, working capital. So you can have just only one objective. Then from the one objective, you can now break it down to three or four hypotheses. Okay, that you are going to test receivable turnover on financial performance. You are going to test this on this. You are going to test this on this, but you trying to write like this, you are just writing in form of a thesis or a project or long essay. So you should try as much as possible to collapse all these things like your research questions, research um, objective into your introduction by just coming up with, with one. You have just only one objective, but all those four objectives that you have, eh, they are basically proxies for the main objective because I know that, okay, you can measure your um, working capital management with, uh, please, uh, can I, can we see your methodology? Because I know you wrote two, two equations there. Please go to your, thank you so much. Uh -huh, yeah. If you look at it, you have um, return on assets, which is the uh, which is equal to you gave the the equation debt turnover ratio, inventory turnover ratio, then cash conversion ratio. That simply means that um, you have proxied the working capital with um, all those variables. You understand it. So you, based on this method, you are just only having one, one objective, you understand, but you have captured yes, it with um, debt turnover ratio, invest um, inventory turnover ratio, then cash and conversion ratio. Then you spoke about your control variable. Uh, okay, okay. In your model two now, you've now added the um PEM size to it is that not so so yes sir. um looking at this that simply means that you are using um model two then to buttress what uh, uh the chair person did say you discover that you have um subscript it in your model both model one and model two which simply shows that uh, you are using a longitudinal research design. So please change the correlation research design into longitudinal because your model as well that you have specified really shows that you are using longitudinal because you have IT and the I is standing in for cross-section and why the T stands for uh, the time space. Do you get it? So you are not using yes, a, a, um, a correlation, but... Um, a longitudinal uh, research uh, design, but uh, we cannot talk much since we cannot see your your results. So thank you for that um, wonderful presentation. Uh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, um, uh, Ajibola. Please yes, if you the correction and uh, send in the paper at the appropriate time. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other person here for presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, my dean is around. Professor Adeshola. Thank you, uh, the chairperson. I have listened very attentively to Fumi Ajibola. For me, Ajibola's presentation. Um, I'm not in accounting. Uh, so I saw the presenter over Zooming and that all of her readers will be familiar with uh, working capital management. And since that's a major theme in your thesis, in your argument, in your paper, I think. You should devote. I have not seen that in your introduction. 
uh, where you talk about working capital management, you just simply assumed that uh, everybody understands what capital, and uh, you know, the idea of writing a paper for publication or for conference purposes is to educate people on key subjects of the research. I have not seen you do that to me. Uh, uh, and I don't have to be in your field to be able to uh, get the thesis you are trying to push. I hope you got my point. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've not oh. that, sir. Thank you, Chairman. That's, that's my concern. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Ajibola. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Any other person can, I can see Dr. Kende Adewa, are you available for presentation? Ajayi Christiana is online, ma'am. Okay, Ajayi Christiana. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can we have your presentation in seven minutes? Okay, thank you, ma. Yes. Please show us your slide. Okay, ma. Are you ready? at all Ajayi Christiana are you still there with us or someone else should take over Ajayi, Christiana, are you there? Hello? Please someone else, maybe someone else. I think you have some issues from your hand. Maybe someone else should make his or her own presentation while Ajayi Christiana gets ready. All right, my other person can go ahead, ma'am. Oh, are you available? Are you ready now? I'm trying to share my slide, ma'am. Okay, it's about coming up. Don't stop, don't stop. Don't stop. Okay. Oh, yeah, share again. Please go ahead and share again. Go to the first slide. Yes, ma. Can All I right. start speaking? Yes, you are good to go. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ajayi Christiana Lalonpe by name. I'm here to present a paper standing on the system protocol. I'm here to present a paper on impacts of globalization on industrial relations. 
during COVID-19 pandemic. The introduction. Globalization has been known to simplify industrial relations. And uh, this is because through globalization, manual industrial activities have been replaced by machine. And uh, that has really helped in enhancing accuracy, pace, efficiency and effectiveness in the industries, according to Amori 2017. There is no doubt about the shift in ground in the labor markets, in liberal markets. Privatization actually has brought in some things that have to involve the globalization in the work, the activities of an organization. And greater division of labor has opened up the opportunity to get specialized talents even across the globe. Technology and automated industrial processes have made it possible for the employers to get the same level of outputs with a reduced workforce uh, as you could see from the experience of COVID-19 in which people are at home and they are working. The organization still continue but for the organization that couldn't get uh, ICT in place, they find themselves in a problem, stoppage in the organizational activities. Objective of the study. The main objective of this study is to examine the effect of ICT on industrial relations during COVID-19 pandemic. And the study was being carried out in international very PLC Malaysia. The hypothesis of the study is that ICT has no significant effect on industrial relations on international BRI PLC. The methodology. The research adopted survey research design and primary data was used to gather data. The sampling technique that was used was a simple random sampling technique. And out of 92 copies of well structured questionnaire distributed to the respondents, only 72 copies of the questionnaire were validly returned and used for the study. And the method of data analysis, we analyzed the data that are through SPSS, which generated the main standard deviation and our X statistics. The results of the hypothesis, the findings show that. From the R square that we have, 0 0.037, we can, see, we can see that just 3.7% of the variable used shows a unit increase in ICT will drink 3.7% improvements on the performance of the organization considered. And I could see the ANOVA. You could see the coefficient variable, and um, the study findings shows that the result shows that the unit increase in the ICT contributes 3.7 improvements on the industrial relations during COVID 19 pandemic. And the study concluded that involvement of the ICT in international BRI during that COVID really helped their operation. They could be able to sustain their operation. And the study also showed that. The rate at which ICT of the organization are being utilized determine the level of their profitability during COVID-19. The recommendation, the study recommend that this, we see the role that ICT played in the operation of the international period during COVID-19. Management should endeavor to recruit employees that are committed to the use of ICT motivates them and give them sustainable support to achieve organizational objectives. Contribution to knowledge. The study helps us to know that ICT contributes immensely to the continuous operation of international BRI during COVID-19 pandemic, and it also helped them to sustain their productivity. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for keeping to time. Uh, um, and thank you for your presentation. Um, please, um, uh, Christiana, if I would ask, what is industrial relations? 
industrial relations is the relationship that exists between the employer and employee. At times, industrial relationship always involve the tripartite relationship between the government, the employee, and the employer. And it also includes the employment relations, all those things that are involving in, in, in the contractual relationship, employment relationship, they are embedded in industrial relations just to ensure the harmonious relationship between the tripartite relationship or between the employer and the employee. And so if that is what industrial relations um, is about, and you are talking about um, uh, the issue of uh, globalization on industrial relations, how have you been able to, I mean, explain to your audience that, I mean, you are talking about the issue of globalization. How um, uh, significant is this your finding to the general populace? Because you carried out this something in, um, where? Elisha. Using how many participants? I'm um, um, 72. So what, where is the issue of globalization here? Uh, if you understand what I'm trying to say. For the storm of COVID-19, if we could see the effects on the organization, how they are unable to get across using the manual process, manual operation during this period is in, was ineffective. And um, globally, organizations have to get across to their vendor, their suppliers, and at the same time using ICT by their employee to get work done during the COVID-19. I think ICT is one of the problems, or is one of the effects of the globalization on Amazon. Yes, thank you very much. But I think the issue of globalization here is not as appropriate as it were. When you want, if you want to bring in the issue of technology, I accept. If you know, if you understand where I'm coming from, we know that, yes, um, uh, so many people were, I mean, work, um, the work structure was hampered during the COVID era and things like that. But when you talk about the issue of glo globalization is more than what you have put here or what you have described here. That is where I have an issue. So if you want to bring in the effect of technology, how it has affected the COVID era or the COVID period, and how it impacts on organization, no problem at all. But when someone picks up this your paper and reads it that the impact of globalization on industrial relations will not be, will be, will want to consider, will want to consider a broader, I mean, um, uh, scope. If you understand what I'm talking about. Are you still there with us? Christiana Ajayi? All right. Yes, I get it, ma'am. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Ma. Yes, ma'am. I'm available, ma. Yes, I understand you, ma'am. Yes, please. I think you need to work on your, on your variables, and I mean, I mean, so such that I'm not saying that beauties cannot be used for as a, a sample, uh, as your sample size, but work on your variables. I mean, tell us, let us be able to relate the variables with, I mean, the topic of discussion. So that's where I have an uh, an issue with your with your, uh, what is it called, with your presentation. And as it were, the literature reviewed, you need to work on those ones too. I mean, you, let us, uh, I would rather advise that you review some current literature. You might need to 
um, uh, rework your topic. You might need to change your topic to suit what you have presented. Because what you have presented is not industrial relations per se. You are talking of how ICT has impacted on the COVID era. And uh, I mean, it has changed the structure of an organization. That is what you are trying to say. If I'm making sense. Are you with us? Yes, I'm with you, Ma, not yet, Ma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ma. Thank you. Any other presenter here? Yes, sir. Uh, my dean wants to make his contribution. Thank you, the chairperson. Christiana Ajayi, I want to be sure that you are with us. I'm on my side. Okay. The chairperson has raised very important issues on your study. First is globalization. The other is industrial relations. I agree totally with her. And I want you to take note of that. This work needs a rework. The topic is impact of globalization on industrial relations during COVID. I'm a student of international relations. I was going to, I was, I was expecting to see you educate me more on globalization. You didn't do any of that. You equally stated in your presentation, I didn't read your work, but in your presentation, you said industry that do not have ICT in place. There's no industry that doesn't have any ICT in place. Even farmers, the rural farmer in the village uses cell phone. And that is uh, some technology of communicating. And so I don't have an idea. Of, I mean, I can't get this, this thesis, this argument about a whole international breweries, Elisha. Are you with me? I'm a whole with international you, breweries, Elisha. Look at the name. International breweries, Elisha. Not having ICT in place. So that's, that's, that's one angle. Just like the chairperson said, if you are talking of set skills in ICT technology, it will be more meaningful than to say that they don't have ICC at all. Okay, we are talking of set skills. And what is it that uh, the breweries produces wheat? If it doesn't have a, 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 what is it called, ICT in place, as you have said. Sir, so, I didn't say they didn't have it in place, sir. I said that's, that's what and said. I said that I don't have it in place. They I have problems during COVID. Oh, you, that's what I got you present, okay? All right. That's sir. what I got you present. That's one. So, two, you equally said ICT or whether globalization, either ICT or globalization, does not have any impact on international breweries. That's how it started. By the time you were to recommend, you were recommending ICTC to ICT to them. Don't you see a contradiction, Ajayi? If you say it doesn't have any impact. So what's the need for the import of that impact? Okay? And so I want you to look at those. You know, for me, I see contradiction in terms. If you say, I mean, it doesn't really matter if they don't have ICCs in uh, international breweries. So why recommend that to them in your conclusion? So I want you to look at that and then link up that to what the chairperson said. We can't be talking of globalization and uh, industrial relations uh, in a local form. If you're talking of ICT and uh, set skills, 
that people have or do not have in that organization is a different ball game. So those are my observations. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I think you have noted all those corrections. Please rework. Yes, ma'am. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Any other person here for presentation? Kenny Adewa said she's just here. She's not here for present. She's just here to participate, not here to make presentation. Any other person here for presentation? Otherwise, we round up this session. I will just assume others are here just to participate. I'm here to present Dr. Bashir Yusuf. Please go ahead if you're ready to make your presentation. Dr. Bashir. Bashir Yusuf, are you there? Bashir Yusuf. Bashir Yusuf, are you available for presentation? Dr. Bashu, you are just typing, and I said you should go on if you are available to present. Any other person here for presentation? I mean, what do we do, sir? My dean, sir. Aha. Uh -huh. Dr. Bashir, I wouldn't know whether you're still there. Any other person here? I am a participant, my co auto currently presenting. Okay, thank you, Mr. Daguro, Dagunduro. Dr. Bashi, we are still waiting for you.
Any other person available for presentation? We want to round up this session. Dr. Bashir Yusuf, are you still available? Hello? Yes, sir. Hello, Ma, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, please, uh, can you please uh, display your slide? Okay, let me do that. Okay. Is it available? No. Can you can you see it, ma? No. You can't see it. No, I can't. Oh, one moment. Dalla, so Kazoism was with Dalla. Now, so you present the issue where I mean that. Dalla, care with Dalla. It's okay. Please give me a few seconds, please. I need it's assistance. Okay. All right, it's all right. Uh, I need assistance. Yes, I need assistance. Yes, I need assistance. Yes, I need assistance. Yes, I need assistance. So that then you presentation come on slicing the appearing. Allah you see appearing just in the next. No, it's not a thing. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, can take something. Hey. Shini ono. Uh, I can I can uh, uh, Yes, we can see you now. Okay, thank you, Ma. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. Good evening. Uh, permit me to stand before the existing protocol. And sorry for the a little delay we experienced. This is the cause of some challenges. So my name is Bashid Yusuf. The title of my topic is Effect of Balanced Psychological Contract on Turnover Intention of Primary School Teachers in Kano State. A work relationship is a contractual type. This contract may either be formal or informal. The formal contract is such a type that uh, an employee and employer are bound by it and they are expected to comply with the provisions or with their agreement, formal agreement. When a breach is experience of this contract, so this uh, could be taken to a court of law for adjudication. So the other type of relationship is psychological contract. Psychological contract is a type of contract that is implicit, it is implied it is not written and workers are expected to fulfill certain expectations of their employers and employees are also expecting certain respect they have their own expectation from their employers so where a kind of this expectation where they are not met then the employee will experience a kind of 
a kind of state of dissatisfaction. And this state of dissatisfaction may likely lead to change in mind that is by thinking of leaving the organization that is turnover intention. Once an employee think of started thinking or develop that kind of turnover intention, then if it is not checked well by the organization or employer, definitely it affects the employee's morale to work in the organization and that may likely leads to turnover intention, which at the end of the day, the employee will check for alternatives where they are available. If alternatives are not available, then he will decide to take measures that will affect the, his performance, affect his, the productivity of the organization, and that may result to a kind of uh, a low kind of productivity. That if they, in the other hand, where they are, uh, there are opportunities outside, the employer will develop that intention of leaving the organization. So turnover intention is a willingness or desire to leave an organization of the, an employer. So in Kano State, uh, uh, State University Education Board, we have problem of this psychological contract. Most of the time you see workers or teachers are not uh, meeting their basic needs because of what? Because of violation of the psychological contract by their employer. So this leads to the kind of flying or leaving of the workplace by the workers. For instance, if you look at from 2016, from 2016 to 2019 to 20, then we have a kind of average rate of turnover in Kano State ranging from 18% to a kind of 30 to 32%. So averagely we have a turnover of 18% in Kano State. So it depends on the type of local government, whether rural or urban, or the type of management of the LGS. For instance, in the working Kuru Nasarawa and, and the Tarauni, we have a kind of 30% turnover, 32% and 25% respectively. This has affected the number of workers needed or required to carry out the services of teaching at the primary level in Kano State. In fact, by the year 2020, the State Universal Business Education Board has a kind of shortfall of staff of over 12,000 teaching staff. And this has definitely affected the performance of the suburb, which invariably led to the shortage of teaching staff in all the primary schools in the state. This has affected the performance of the students and it has also affected the entire performance of the suburb. So it is the intention of this research or of this study to investigate to what extent does balanced psychological contract affect uh, teachers' uh, turnover intention. Uh, to achieve this, we raise, we, we raise a kind of objective that we sought to achieve. That is to assess the effect of the, uh, primary school teachers' turnover intention uh, balanced psychological control on primary school teachers turnover intention. So we hypothesize that to what extent, or uh, we hypothesize that the hypothesis reads as the study hypothesized that balanced psychological contact has no significant effect on turnover intention of primary school teachers in Kano State. So in terms of literature review, we review the concept of balanced psychological contact, we review the concept of turnover intention, and we look at the theoretical on the opinion of the study, which is based on social extent theory by Hormans, 1958. Based on his own assumption, based on the assumption of this theory, he has uh, uh, explored that this, there are set of, uh, the, the theory is based on five set of assumptions. The first assumption is the success proposition, and the second is stimulus proposition, the third is value proposition and then to privatization, the privation suggestion proposition and emotion or call due to different reward situation. What this means is the situation in which the behavior of individual that determines his nature of action. Once an individual is, is affected by a kind of uh, action from his employer, so that will determine the kind of behavior he will display. That kind of behavior, well, for instance, you put on all your effort, and that effort is not reciprocated by your employer. It definitely affects your kind of stimulus 
to act. It affects your behavior to act. Then that affection or that kind of uh, effect, it has invariable uh, effect on the behavior of the worker. That may likely lead him to feel a lack of, uh, like he wants to leave the organization once the opportunities are there. If the opportunities are not there, he will develop a kind of, a kind of way to manage his own stressful situation. So this theory is found to be worthy of explaining the balanced psychological contact, uh, how it relates to workers or teachers' uh, turnover intention. So the methodology adopted by the study is a cross-sectional survey research design. Why adopting cross-sectional survey research design? I, the study adopted this because it studies a, a, a group of portion or it generates data at once. And this gives a kind of ability to carry out a research within a minima, minimum period of time that will give a kind of ability to generalize on the entire population. So the target population is 2000 and the target population is 2080, ranging from the population of primary school teachers from Ajingi local government as selected area, and then Taroni LGA also as another area selected for the study. So using Christian Morgan, a sample size of 322 was right, and that leads to the distribution of 322 questionnaires, where out of that 322 questionnaires administered to primary school teachers, 300 questionnaires were retreat. Um, yeah, and and uh, these 300 questionnaires, it constitute like 93% of the rate of return, which is, according to some scholars, is substantial enough to represent the entire population. So in the analysis of data, PLS was used, and then through using the PLS, normality and multicollinearity tests were also carried out. And it was found that, yes, the, the result or the validity and reliability of the construct, they are valid to measure what they are expected to measure, and they give expected result. In this regard, using the PLS, two types of tests were carried out. First is the assessment model test, and the other one is the structural model test. The essence of assessment model is to see how valid and reliable our instruments are. So based on what is so far obtained, the, li the liability and validity is so sound that it can lead to the attainment of the objectives of the, of the, of the study. So based on the structural model, which tests the hypothesis, that is the relationship between or the effect of the uh, independent variable or construct on the dependent construct. So the result shows that uh, result based on the test already shows that balanced psychological contract has significant effect on turnover intention of primary school teachers, which shows which indicates that balanced psychological contracts were found to be positive with a beta value of 0 0.461 and T statistics of 3.581 and the P value of 0 0.00 and significantly related to turnover intention. This is the uh, test result. Based on this, we corroborated the findings with the previous findings, and we conclude that in view of the data presented and analyzed, as well as hypothesis tested, the findings of this study have considerable implications and consequences of unmet and unspecified expectations and obligations of the employee-employer relationship in public primary schools in Kano State. Based on this, we recommended that first, the Kano State government should give or should make all necessary effort to provide favorable working environment for primary school teachers in the state. To ensure this, government needs to do one, give priority to ensuring the fulfillment of primary school teachers' balanced psychological contract through internet opportunities for training. This could be done by giving the LGS power to release staff for in-service training and organizing periodic seminars, workshops, symposium, to the primary school teachers. Secondly, provide more opportunities for primary school teachers for skill of development through effective and quality supervision and development opportunities within the organization. And the third, the primary school teachers should be given more opportunities for advancement and promotion, which is lacking. This could be done by ensuring that the previous year's promotion backlog, which is from 2017 to date, was settled and making proper provision for teachers' promotion 
and advancement in the LGS and suburb annual appropriations. I'm putting control measures to ensure effective compliance by the authorities concerned. If this is put into consideration, definitely the psychology, balanced psychological contract of primary school teachers will be attained, and that will give them a kind of a kind of room for reciprocating the effort of the state government and their employer in what in providing the expected services that will make the primary education to prosper and develop to achieve what it is intended to achieve. This is all about the paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yusu. Thank you, Ma. You have really made a very, um, uh, don't stop sharing. You made a good presentation. Thank you, Ma. Your, you've carried out very good analysis. Yeah, at least I am uh, educated. I have an understanding of what your paper means right now. And uh, I would want to say um, uh, in your model, yes, that should be you, there was a place you wrote structural model. That yes. should be structural equation model. Yes, yes, and, using, uh, yes. using PLS. Yes, yes. The smart PLS, yes. Yes, equation model. So, yes. and I would want you, one thing I would want you to, um, maybe it's in the body of your work. You have yes. not shown us the graphical display of how the variables relate. It would have uh, been so appropriate. Just make yes. sure you include it inside the body of the work. Okay, ma. Okay, ma. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Thank you, thank you. And another thing I want you to do, please, please yes. update your literature. Okay, yes. okay. Uh, yes, there are so okay. many, um, uh, what is it called, um, uh, authors that would have carried out relevant, very relevant researches, you know? Okay. Now, those are, I can say 2011, 2010, 20, you know, they are, this is 2022. Just try to yes. update the literature a bit. Okay, ma. Understand. Okay. It's a very okay. nice work, a good work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. My, no, yes, Dr. Bab Yusuf, I think you're still there with us. You, okay, thank you. yes, please. In your you. presentation, uh, my colleague was just saying that there are some places where you use at all, you utilize some, some, you didn't put some into italics. It's not supposed to be in italics, but all AL at the back should have a full stop. That's okay. the, the latest recommendation. Yes. Okay, not it. Not it. Must it must be spent. Yes, not, not in it. Italy. Yes. Okay. Thank okay. you very not much. It. Thank you. Think Martin wants to say something. Hold on for my dance. Okay, okay. Okay, ma'am. Uh, thank you, the Japerson. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yusuf, I'm thanking the Japerson. I will come to you, Yusuf. Okay, okay. Yeah, Dr. Yusuf. Yes, sir. Um, your, your paper is very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. But my comments will be critical, and I okay. want them to take it in good faith. Okay, yeah, they are all welcome, sir. Very well. Um, you made a spirited effort to educate us on balanced psychological contract. Yes, sir. And the impact of that on Kano State teachers. Yes, turnover intention. Yeah, yeah, turnover intention. In, yes, in Kano State. Um, I, I have these few questions and I want you to okay. ask yourself those questions after okay. this session. Okay, sir. It's going to help in your publication. It's going okay, to help sir. you through this paper. Okay, sir. I, uh, since we are not together, uh, we are in the virtual class. You yes, may not sir. be answering me, but you know I want you to process it. What is okay. your discipline? What is your discipline? My discipline? Discipline. My discipline is public administration. Okay. Specializing in human resource management. 
it's okay, it's okay. Where do you want to publish this article? Uh, this can be published in, it has dual or triple advantages. It can be published in the Journal of Public Administration. It can be published in the Journal of Organizational Behavior. It can be published in the Journal of uh, Journal of Human Resource Management. Very well. That's th thank you. Uh, you have to process that more critically beyond where you want to publish it, uh, because if you are a public administrator, yes, sir, you are not a psychologist. Yes, you are talking of balanced psychological contract. Yes, one will begin to query your competence. The Study. editor, your competence. Okay, myself. Okay. Beyond, beyond your presentation, I don't want you to be answering me. Let me let me come with my comment. You can come okay. with your reply later on, so that uh, okay. we will not be interjecting our our okay. thoughts. Uh -huh. okay, Allow me to to come with my uh, position. He might agree with you. He might not agree with you, but uh, you know, it's going to help you eventually. Okay. We're talking of balanced psychological contract. What does it mean? Where is your competence? Are you a psychologist? Beyond this presentation, and that which to me is very fair. Your skill set to be able to, to, to check balance, are you with me? Balance psychological contract is questionable. If I am the editor of any journal that you have uh, submitted this to, I will query that. Now, where's your competence? You are a public uh, administrator, you are not a psychologist, you are not a medical doctor. Uh, what are you using? For me, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, I'll run into problems with you, and these are things that will pose back to you. Give us the variables that you used. Give us how do you check the psychological balance of people? Are you are you with me? And that's where I'm yes, going. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. so you must, hello, 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 Doctor Yusuf. You yes. must be able to answer those questions and speak to them if you must publish this paper. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Oh, the I understand uh, 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 the area from which Dr. Yusuf is coming from. That place is situated in management, employer-employee relationship. So of my, course. you know, it might not really be a psychologist. It's like um, um uh, looking at a, a balance scorecard. It's just a terminology within the e area of human resources. Yes, sir. So <laughs> thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And that's why I said Dr. Yusuf must, must speak to that when he wants to publish this article. I've never seen from the beginning to the end of the presentation and the, the slides that you, you, you showed, where you define it, where you discuss it, where you conceptualize it, where you educate your reader. And that is very important, you know, for any paper to get published, okay? Thank you very much, sir. So you have noted that, please. Just yes, ma'am. Operationalize your variable. It is all there in the work. Okay, all right. It is Thank all you. there. It is Thank in the work. All right. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you for Thank your you. presentation. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All ma. right. I wish you best of luck. Thank you. Well done for your effort. Thank you. Amidst the uh, current situation, you all managed to organize this kind of wonderful conference. It's not easy at all. And thank you for joining I, us. I need, I need to adopt that in my faculty of administration too. Maybe you send me the idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very yes. much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh -huh. Have a nice evening. Thank you. And you too. Um, uh, there is somebody here that said he, he or she, I wouldn't know, sent a video. According to, he didn't get it. Okay, so Dr. Abiro has confirmed that he didn't get the video. Are you online to present exceptional? I wouldn't know exceptional. There's something is being displayed as exceptional one. one. Exceptional one, are you available to make your presentation? Because we want to round up now. Exceptional one, you are online, you are here. If you are available, just make your presentation. We want to round up.
Exception, are you there? Abdul Fatai, <coughs> I think you are coming a bit late. I give you five minutes to make your presentation. Are you available? Available, I'm available, ma. Please, you have five minutes. We are, oh. we are out of time. Oh, sorry, ma. Okay. Can you display your slide? Okay, I've been displaying it. I've displaying it. Have you seen it? No. I'm coming, I'm coming. No. Let me share. Let me share. Let me share. share. Share the screen. Okay. Done. Done. It's not done, no. Okay. Now, you yeah, oh, please, in five minutes. You have five minutes. I'll five minutes. Now, ma. Please go to your objective, go to your findings. It's simple. Objectives and findings, please. Let us see. Objective. This methodology Hello. and findings. Methodology of this study is, uh, is looking at uh, personal control, cultural control, and uh, performance of public university in Southwest. Yes, this what are your objectives? No, no, no. What, objective are objective? what did you my say? Object, my specific objective are the effect of a uh, personal control. And the cultural control on the performance of a public investing in, in, in Southwest. And what were your findings? Uh, the findings, uh, my findings are that personal control have effect, personal have effect on the significant performance, uh, on a significant effect on performance of the selected sample public investing in Southwestern Nigeria. So which methodology we, did you use? The, we, the study you say is a cross-sectional is a cross-sectional data in nature. The data collector is a cross-sectional. I use uh, PLSA. Okay. I use PLSA. Are you display, please display. Okay. It's display now. I've displayed it, ma. Uh, show us the slide. Go to the slide of your methodology. Okay. 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 What is happening here? Have you seen it? No, I have not seen it. Because. Okay. 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 What of now? It's, it's displaying now, ma. It's displaying. No, no, we can just see the title page. Just the first slide. Okay. What is, what is the problem here? I've tried to, to, to press it to, to the next, uh, next slide. I'm unable to, I don't know what happened. Okay, you can see it now. Yes, now scroll down to the methodology, let's see. This is the methodology, yes, sorry. Sorry, is the, is the network issue here, ma. So, yeah. you got this, uh, we are in the methodology. This is methodology and the way in which uh, the source of that data, the population <coughs> of the and the techniques of a, uh, Data analysis. Including can you show you can, the same you diagram? The, you have the same diagram here. Yeah? The, the analysis and the Hello. interpretation. Please show us your same diagram. Do you have it there? Yeah, the same diagram. Yeah, okay, let me. Hello. It's okay. Please go and work on that. There is. How the network has it? Have you seen it? No. Okay. No. I don't think you included it here. Please just ensure that you include it in your what is it called? Um, what is it called? The in the body of the work, please. I didn't include the PowerPoint. In the, in the, in the, in the yes. work is in the yes. We want to see how the re it's in the body of the work more. How they are related. So Thank the you second much. paper, are you there? Oh yeah, there is no second paper. We are out of time, Where's please. It? Thank you very much. Yes, sir. My dean wants to say oh, something. God, no, I've sent the video, voice a video of that the second paper and the. It will be as now.
It's now control and control control. Um, Please, what is the title of your paper? Yes, yes, yes. What is the title of your paper? But the title of my paper is uh, to uh, Tertiary Institutional Student Insurance Scheme. Actually, this presentation no. ought to have no, come about. Me. Uh, you were not the one who presented now. Abdul Fatah. No. Abdul Fatah. Abdul Fatah. Okay, Akwan, please go ahead. <coughs> All right, thank you. Ma. I just want to discuss uh, this paper. I have said it in. Let me share the screen, just the topic, then I'll, I'll go to the findings. Your topic objectives. Objectives and findings. All right. Uh, this paper, I don't know, we can see it. We can see it. All right. It's about uh, the program that the uh, federal government brought called the uh, student, uh, it's the uh, tertiary is, uh, institute of student health insurance program. Under this program, students are asked to pay 1,000 Naira every semester. So what we actually did, it was just like my undergraduate students whom I asked to find out if the students are actually benefiting from this program. So what we need to do was to set up a, a questionnaire where we had to administer to students and the objective was to look at the cost of healthcare that's, uh, services that students have in the institution and the access to healthcare. What we find out from this was that the cost of student healthcare was not affected, significantly affected by this particular program. Why we find out that is because the cost boils down to the purchases of drugs, not the free services, that students get only free services, but the cost of buying drugs was still driving the cost of healthcare services high. And the second one was access. We discovered that, yes, this program has actually given students access to healthcare, but it never actually impacted positively on their cost. So that was the findings that we made. And we had to look at the recommendations where we have to at least advise the federal government if they can look at subsidizing the cost of medicine or the call of drugs for students in the universities. That was our recommendation. Thank you very much. I hope um, uh, um, uh, what is it called? All your variables were appropriately measured. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because we you can't. Um, uh, let Let's see your methodology. The is he included? I, yeah, I had challenges in the preparation of the slide because I was having exams, so I had to rush. So that's the extent we have in the methodology. How do you want us to survey. address your paper now? Yeah, we, we, we use survey. If you won't mind, I can maybe upload this. The, I can share the, this particular abstract. The methodology is um, pointed out in these abstracts. Speak on it. Speak to it okay. now. Speak. Just speak to it. The, don't read. Though. Don't read, please. Yeah. The, 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 in summary, the methodology is here in this abstract. The method we actually adopted was uh, qualitative with focus on exploratory design. From here, we 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 developed a kind of a uh, the scale for students to answer. Then we adopted a model 
a kind of a model called the Mumpun's Golden Triangle idea. And Hello, please. Can you go to the methodology section of this paper? Now the oh, paper okay. is on the screen. Go to the methodology section. Okay. Let me drop this. I don't know where this paper got to be. You should be able to describe your methodology. Tell us your I methodology in, in, the, um, in just two or three sentences. Dr. Akwan, I think you should go back and do justice to your yes, work. Yes, I'm trying to upload. I'm trying to. Okay. Our time is up. Oh my God. It's okay. Thank you very much. I think I will I will do no thank I'll you very proper. much. Yeah. You I thought you. you said you were looking for it. Yes, but I and I told you I, my laptop had issues. I had they said they had the crashed this morning. Okay. So I'm just trying to do a makeup. Are you sure you have concluded that paper? Sure, sure. I, I had sent this before we went on strike since last year. I had sent this. I am always one of the person that I don't miss OAU conference. I don't miss the entire day. They know me very well. Last year I presented. Year well, before I last, rather. Right I presented. Now you cannot speak to this yeah. methodology. You can't speak to it. Oh, Thank you right. very much. Please work on that paper. Thank you for okay. joining All us right. at the conference. Thank you. I think we can close this session. Thank you, sir.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. With the kind permission of the session, we want to close the 2022 fifth conference of the Faculty of Administration. We thank everybody for coming. But briefly, we want to take two or three comments, observations, or remarks. In order to save our time, I think I'll just take the microphone to wherever the spirit leads. I want to start with Professor Aru Salau. He was the chairman of the conference last session. And we thank God he's alive and he's here with us again today. So we want to take his comments, his observations moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, the vice chairman and local organizing committee. And I want to use this opportunity to congratulate the dean of the faculty, Professor Adesola. As far as I'm concerned, this is a successful conference. Organizing conference involves a lot of commitment, time, treasure, and all these have been fested for the success of this conference. And at the same time, I want to commend the committee members. You have done a good job. God will reward you bountifully. There's a parallel session still going on over there. I'm saying this on behalf of the Dean. Those who have presented their papers, there's still opportunity for them apart from conference proceeding. I strongly believe the committee will still subject them to review after the presentation. They are still going to return back the corrected fashion. The Dean of the faculty has revived the faculty journal about two weeks ago, uh, the three volumes of the four volumes of the edition of the journal were out. And uh, I'm aware that journal website is uh, in the pipeline, probably 80% completed. Even the four volumes, they are going to upload it on the website. And I strongly believe that the papers from this conference will be selected based on their merit and quality that the committee will work on and transferred to the journal committee uh, member. On this note, I want to congratulate the Dean of the Faculty, the conference committee, staff for faculty of administration, and more importantly, our professor here who presented the keynote address is our father and the faculty, Professor Fawale. We really appreciate your contribution. Thank you, Professor Adeyeye from the Department of Local Government and Development Study. These are the people that supported uh, this conference. For them to stay put from the beginning to the end, they, commend, they demand commendation. Thank you, sir. God will renew your strength. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We want to hear the voice of Professor M. Adeyeye also. We have not heard your voice, Oga. So we want to hear your comments, assessment of the conference moving forward. Sir. Yeah, we, we, we're grateful that uh, the, the conference, we planned to have this thing for some time and then that uh, took place today. We need to be, to be grateful. And we do appreciate those that uh, were here to witness this thing too. We are grateful and then We've had a lot of contribution from uh, Professor Sayer and then from uh, members in the parallel sessions. And then, and then we think we carried on from here about uh, knowledge production, knowledge creation, and knowledge deployment. And then we are grateful. And then we continue to be grateful for the organizers, the local organizing committee. We are grateful for them for this, uh, for this uh, conference. And then uh, we wish you the best in uh, whatever you want to do about your career. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. So we want to take one comment. Sorry, I'm taking your time from somebody outside of OAU. Are you speaking, you are from Musica. Are you also from Musica? Madonna University, who is speaking? Musica. Yeah. 
I want to use this opportunity to greet uh, my my academic father, Professor Alade, and the uh, other professors here present and the uh, other lecturers. It's my pleasure to be in the midst of scholars to deliberate on how best to administer the welfare of Nigerians. So I'm from uh, Nsuka actually running a program there, but I'm lecturing in Madonna University, Okija campus. So it's a pleasure to be here so far, so good. I have been enjoying the program and I've been enjoying the parallel session was awesome. I don't know how to say it, but it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, um, my name is Andrea Kuche. In, in addition to what he just said, I think I really appreciated um, this conference so far. I have learned a whole lot, particularly with the keynote address um, in the morning. I, I learned a lot from Prof. And Prof, I'll say thank you so much. I, what I didn't know, I, I knew them today. And this conference really afforded me the opportunity to do that. And then the prior session too was awesome, as he said. We really enjoyed our time. The liberation was very okay, and uh, we learned a lot. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you very much. Last but not the least, Mrs. Adenike, gender balance. I don't know how you can balance it. She is a PhD candidate for my department, local government and development studies. So let's hear your comments. Good afternoon, my august air president. The Dean of the Faculty of Administration. I don't even know what to say. Um, I really appreciate my guests for allowing me to be part of this occasion. And I want to say I have learned a lot of things as a student, and I will never forget this experience. And the parallel session too was also, I really enjoyed it. And I wish to have more experience. Thanks so very much, Amas. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we now go to the vote of thanks and closing prayer. Okay, Dr. Aluko, please step out for the vote of thanks. Yes, I have the mandate of the dean to announce that we will move around between now and 12 noon tomorrow to meet the chairman of different parallel sessions. You can please help us write your report so that we can combine it and come up with an issue to communicate for this conference. So we'll come around, sir, to do that formally. Dr. Nusal. Good afternoon, my guys here and um, everyone present here this evening. On behalf of the Dean and members of staff of the Faculty of Administration, I want to say thank you for coming and for participating in today's conference. Your ideas, and your contributions have made this conference very robust. And we pray that as you go home, you get home safely in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. The Vice Dean Faculty of Admin, Dr. O. Adeyemi, please step out for the closing prayer. And we acknowledge and appreciate the participants that have been with us online since. We appreciate you all. Members of the LOC committee, Dr. Elena Deremi, who is unavoidably absent. We appreciate her. We appreciate every member. Dr. Lara Akeyemi, Dr. M. Bilo. I know the full meaning of M, but I'll not say it. <laughs> Dr. M. Bilo, thank you. Other members of the committee. Okay, they are doing fine. So, Vice in, sir. Closing prayer. Thank you very much, sir. Our Father, we want to appreciate you for all you have done for us. We appreciate it because it is not by our power, nor by our might. My spirit says the Lord. Father, we return all the glory unto you now in the mighty name of Jesus. As you go, please go with us in the mighty name of Jesus. People that will be going to their very destination, I pray that your divine person, divine power, will go with them in the mighty name of Jesus. They shall not be accident in the mighty name of Jesus. We we'll pray for the dean, the professors, the OU at large. We pray that you move us forward in the mighty name of Jesus. Pray for the Nigeria University. I pray, O oh Lord, that all our challenges, O oh Lord, you solve it for us in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you because you answer our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, sir. DJ Music.
Thank you for coming. Hey, on the Saturday, we will get back to participate. You already have your name. Shout out oh, to the ones where they run things. Behind the scenes, they know they see you. You they walk, you they try, you they make sure you say everything okay, okay. So I live with you. Who say, oh, you are no go shame you. Oh, share it. Good morning. Wake up. Yes.